the city of Madison Heights, Michigan. Tonight, we welcome experts from all levels of government to inform our residents about what happened and what will happen at the electroplating services site on 10 Mile Road. I'm Brian Hartwell, I'm the mayor of Madison Heights. Uh, joining me tonight is city manager Melissa Marsh and members of our city council, Mark Bliss, Kim Clark, Robert Corbett, Rosalind Grafstein, Emily Rohrbach, and Dave Soltis. Special recognition to Rosalind, who answered my call to fill in during my absence. As frightening as this contamination and pollution event was to watch unfold, it's important to note that it's contained, that the drinking water is safe, and that after the cleanup, the property values will not be impacted and above all, that all levels of your government are coordinating this cleanup. In a crisis, we need stable leaders who don't operate out of emotion or partisanship, but we need leaders instead who operate out, a, out of a calming sense of authority, patience for the facts, and resolve to get the job done. Today's panelists, are true leaders. From the City of Madison Heights Fire Department, Police Department, and Department of Public Services, all the way to the experts and scientists at Eagle and EPA, the men and women who are present here tonight are sincerely here to protect and inform us. And tonight, tonight's public briefing is recognition and demonstration that your safety comes first. So welcome to the City of Madison Heights. Thank you for bringing your questions and your ideas. And next I invite Congressman Andy Levin to say a few words. Thank you very much, Mayor Hartwell. Um, I want to first tell you that uh, we have representatives from both of our US Senators uh, here. James Jackson is here. I haven't seen James yet, but I know there he is right over there. For Senator Peters and Jeremy Marley is here uh, somewhere right down there at the end for uh, Senator Stabenow. And the three of us, uh, your three federal elected officials, have been uh, paying attention to this alarming situation uh, right from the first day. Uh, my uh, district director, Walt Herzig, is here, and most importantly, uh, my outreach staff who does uh, the work in uh, Madison Heights, Eleanor Gamalski is here. There's Eleanor right there. Uh, so, uh, this is a situation that calls for uh, cooperation of all parties, put politics aside, put partisanship aside, and solve the problem, figure out what happened, and that we will never let it happen again. And, uh, there you go. And I just want you to know that the city of Madison Heights and Oakland County have been tremendous partners working with us, uh, the state of Michigan, and mainly EGLE, the, the, the name of the department that works on this, um, Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, and the federal EPA. Uh, I am outraged that we're sitting here in 2020 and we don't have tens of places like electroplating services. We don't have hundreds, we have thousands. And it's just uh, really in a weird way a blessing that this facility sits in an industrial area right next to an expressway that's below grade. So we even found out with this famous green ooze coming out right onto the expressway. How many industrial facilities are there that don't happen to have the water going out in a way that the whole public would see it? And yet, things like chromium-6 are going down into the ground. For the sake of our kids and our grandkids, we've got to do better. And so just what I'm looking for at the federal level is a couple of things. One, we've got to fully fund the Environmental Protection Agency's cleanup operations if we expect to be able to go after these corporate polluters. So that we are committed to that. 
And that hasn't always been reflected in the budgets that have been sent to us by the administration. So I'm hoping that a situation like this lets us move beyond partisanship and Republicans and Democrats and independents all work together. Secondly, I am particularly outraged that we have situations just like electric plating services where someone polluted the, the, our one precious earth we have for decades and now they don't have any resources, they're bankrupt, and who's left holding the bag? The taxpayers. We've got to pass reforms so that polluters pay. And we have a bill, the state needs to work on this, but at the federal level, which is what I'm responsible for to you, we have a bill uh, put in by Chairman Frank Pallone, the chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, called the Superfund Polluters Pay Act, so that the, the polluters pay a tax on their, on, when they have these toxic chemicals, so that even if somebody like this go, goes bankrupt, the taxpayers are not left holding the bag. So I feel like there's a lot we need to do to rectify this situation. <laughs> Finally, I want to apologize to you. I'm going to have to uh, leave. To, I've got to catch the last plane tonight. Uh, tomorrow is the State of the Union. It's my job to represent you there. So I'm going to stay just as long as I can. Thank you all for turning out. This is so important to us uh, that we get this right. And now I want to turn things over to our great state senator, Jeremy Moss. Uh, good evening, Madison Heights. I'm Jeremy Moss. I'm the state senator for the 11th Senate District. I have the pleasure of representing 11 thriving communities in Oakland County, including Madison Heights. So I welcome you here, and I thank you all for coming to this important update. Uh, I want to assure the folks here uh, that we're treating this very seriously. Uh, and, and this is a big deal for all of us. Uh, it's why we worked together, hand in hand, to make sure every agency is represented in one room at one time uh, to answer your questions. It's also why we've been having regular meetings uh, with representatives from various state and federal agencies to ensure that they have all the resources and connections they need to carry out the proper remediation and cleanup efforts of this site. Uh, personally, uh, for anyone uh, who's met me along the way, you know that my top priority uh, in my entire tenure in the legislature uh, is working to increase government transparency in state government. And we've seen what happens when government officials act with no accountability in the state, particularly when it comes to environmental concerns and the damage that that can cause within a community. Uh, there are so many problems that have led up to this point. I'm personally thankful uh, for all of the agency officials you're gonna hear from. They have been accountable and responsive to our needs here uh, in state government. Uh, but I've been trying to urge our colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join us on this effort to promote and push forward solutions uh, that, that we've de that from the problem that we've dealt with here in Madison Heights. I spoke out recently on the Senate floor about this contamination. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join me on working and fixing those holes that exist in state law that have allowed this to occur. So tomorrow, I will be representing you before an oversight hearing uh, in the State Senate before the Senate Environmental Quality Committee on this contamination. I'll be listening to you here, the residents tonight. I'll be delivering your thoughts to my colleagues in Lansing tomorrow, because if this can happen here in Madison Heights, it can happen everywhere in the state, in every district. And this particularly bad actor has property throughout the state, and it is playing out elsewhere in other people's districts. So I've already sponsored and co-sponsored numerous bills that touch on these matters. Uh, we're continuing to make our case to Senate and House leadership to give these bills a hearing and a vote, uh, but there's more work to be done. In the coming days, you'll be hearing more from me on these efforts, more from Representative Ellison on these efforts as we introduce legislation to get tougher on polluters and to put better standards forward relating to the cleanup of contamination in our ground, in our water, and in our air. Uh, so far, these various departments and agencies seem hamstrung by outdated and inconsistent laws when it comes to their enforcement abilities. They've also been uh, hearing concerns that there aren't, isn't enough people, there isn't enough money to carry out the various jobs that are assigned to them. So I'm committed 
in Lansing, in the State Senate, as your representative to finding solutions for Madison Heights, for solutions for every community in the state of Michigan, and delivering them all the way to the governor's desk. So because you and I both know that this situation played out not overnight, but for many, many years, and we cannot wait another 20 years for an incident like this to be addressed, which is what seems to have happened uh, with this particular location. So I'm ready to work side by side with our state representative, Jim Ellison, with our county officials, with our federal officials, with our local officials uh, to find solutions here. I'm looking forward to learning more here from the presentation, looking forward to hearing your thoughts so that I can deliver them to my colleagues in Lansing and get to work uh, with our state representative, Jim Ellison, who's gonna come up right now and give an update from the House of Representatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Moss. I'll try to be brief because he took too much, too much time. Uh, thank you all for coming. This is really heartwarming to see this many people come out to try to get the good, solid information that we're trying to get out there. Um, but I want to stress that we as elected officials are here tonight so that we can listen to what they have to say, so we can listen to what you have to say, so we know what the message is that we have to take back to Lansing. We um, uh, started with, this morning, we dropped, um, I was one of uh, eight legislators that dropped a package of bills. Uh, to start this process. It's our, our polluter pay bills, which is going to harden the uh, enforcement of the, uh, these bad actors like Gary Sayers um, and, and force them to perform like they should be. So we dropped those bills today, and that is just the start of the legislation that, that we're gonna do. <clears throat> the environmental process in the state of Michigan is uh, behind the times for any number of reasons. Uh, and Senator Moss and I have talked to this on ours about what we need to do to uh, get some legislation passed in both the House and the Senate, and we, uh, we have vowed to do that. Uh, <coughs> Senator Moss and I have been working steadily since, uh, well, the first meeting I went to was Christmas Eve morning at nine o'clock, which is right after we were all uh, aware that this was happening. And we have met regularly, we have talked on the phone for endless hours to try to make sure that we're all coordinating this together and uh, it, the, the process is working. We've got excellent people on site. Uh, we've got excellent people in the city of Madison Heights. We've got all kinds of cooperation from um, you know, all around the area to, uh, to get this done. Um, I do want to point out, I want to give a thank you to a Facebook group called Madison Heights Cleanup. <laughs> I talked to those folks this morning and, I, and or this afternoon and I told them it is a classic example of what a Facebook information page should be. It is concise, it is disseminating information, it is not bad mouthing and complaining, and it's very well moderated. So congratulations to them. They have been a huge asset in getting the information spread out on this whole issue. Uh, I also have two of my colleagues here from the House uh, that are working with us on this legislation. They aren't directly impacted, but they're close enough. We have uh, State Representative Lori Stone, who represents the city of Warren. <laughs> and we also have State Representative Robert Wittenberg, who amongst the seven cities he serves include Hazel Park. So uh, they have committed to us, as have dozens of other uh, state legislators in Lansing to help us get this process through. So. Uh, we're working for you. We're going to take you the information tonight. Feel free to reach out to us and, and ask your questions of us on the legislative side. But I'm very confident these people are going to give you the factual information so that you can go home tonight. Totally, not, not totally understanding, but better understanding the process we're going through. So uh, thank you. Uh, it is my honor to introduce our next speaker, County Executive Dave Coulter. Thank you, Representative Ellison. And by the way, I'm Dave Coulter, the County Executive, and also a proud member of Madison Heights Cleanup. Uh, so just know, I'm listening and we are listening. And we are committed at the county level to make sure we do everything we can to fix the issue here in Madison Heights. This is a travesty that should never have happened, frankly. 
Uh, as Senator Moss indicated, it's been going on for 20 years, and that is about 19 and a half years too long. And so one of the important things that we have to do is make sure that we understand how that was able to happen. And I, frankly, I'm equally concerned because as awful as this has been, the silver lining is that at least it did ooze onto 696. Uh, and it was green so that we could see it because there's 3,000 other sites across the state, dozens in Oakland County that have the same problem. And one of the most disturbing things I heard when I was giving testimony in Lansing about this from the director of Eagle, and this, isn't, this was just an honest assessment, I, I, I appreciate her frankness, but she said if we tried to pour this kind of resources into all 3,000 problems, monitoring and remediating them, we don't have enough people and we don't have enough money. Well, we better find the resources and the money because this is critical. There's nothing more important. And on that note, I, I want to thank Eagle because they have prioritized this and they've done a wonderful job and tonight is part of that. They've met with us privately. We've been working since, uh, since before New Year's together as a group and they've been part of that, the EPA as well, and they, it's been all hands on deck and they've made a priority of this and, and, and so I thank them for that. And I also have to give a shout out to your mayor and council here in Madison Heights because they jumped on this immediately. They rounded us up on uh, literally New Year's Eve and said, we gotta have a meeting. We gotta strategize how to, how to push back. So we met on New Year's Eve to, to, to begin with. A big issue is gonna be the cost, right? And we know that this is going to be an expensive cleanup. But what I've also learned is that we can't begin the full remediation until we do two things. Number one, until we have full testing, and so it, it is critical that we get a complete testing and monitoring of this area to make sure we know exactly where this spill has occurred and how far, so that's number one. And number two, that can't happen, the full remediation can't happen until we demolish that building. And unfortunately, uh, because we don't have good polluter pay laws in Michigan, in my opinion, uh, the business owner is on the hook for it and the likelihood of us getting that money out of him is slim. And so I have promised and reached out and promised the mayor and the council here that the county will help provide whatever resources we need to tear that building down because we're not gonna let the demolition delay the cleanup. So you have our commitment as a county on that. So I just, again, want to thank you all for turning out. This is an important part of the process that Eagle and EPA have heard from us, but it's just as critical that they hear from you, they understand your concerns, and they address those. So thank you for being part of the democratic process, uh, and we're here with you. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thanks, everyone. I had one more job. Uh, we have an amazing water resources commissioner in Oakland County, Jim Nash, who's been our resources commissioner for almost eight years now. He has made water quality and, and safe drinking water a priority, and I'm happy to introduce our water resource director, uh, 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 commissioner, excuse me, Jim Nash. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody coming out tonight. As the congressman said, and the mayor said, and, and Dave said, this is not just about what we need to do, the, the rules we need to change, how we need to look at it. We need to pay for this stuff. And it's been year after year we've seen environmental programs cut, the funding cut for it. It's something we really need to do. My office, um, we do drains. Now, this has not impacted the county drains that we um, have in this area. We've, we've looked at the, uh, the inter-county drains that go between us and Macomb County. They've done testing, they haven't found anything except for the kind of the background level of this. So we haven't seen it go that far so far. My office has an environmental uh, group within it that we are following this very closely. We've been working with the EPA, the DEQ, sorry, Eagle, um, and uh, the city uh, all through this process and we'll continue doing that. We're gonna protect our water resources to make sure that none of this gets out into the, into the water that we depend on in our Great Lakes and our inland lakes. So, we have to make sure that we protect the water. That's what my office will always be doing. It's good to work with the folks that are on, on doing this for the uh, on site for this site. And again, these kind of sites are not rare. Unfortunately, with the lower with with the uh, the, the budgets that were were given for the for our state programs, they've been having to treat this more like the triage you do for emergency medicine, where you do the most important things first, and you hold off on the ones uh, that that are less impactful. So that's what they tried to do. Unfortunately. These kind of things, they catch up to you later. So the more money we have in our budgets, 
the more people we have doing this work, the less we'll have of these kind of things just springing on us like this. This is what we need to be doing. We need to be doing this on the long-term scale to make sure that we're paying attention to this. We're not letting it slide year after year, that we need the money to do that. So local governments can't do that. We just don't have the funding to do it. We need the state and the feds to come in and help us do this. This is what we need to be doing. If this doesn't come out of this emergency, then we failed on it. We have to make sure that we learn our lessons here and we continue doing that going forward. Oakland Pond County will play a part in that as we through the executive departments, health department, things like that, and through my office. So going forward, I want to introduce Gary Gilbrey, the uh, county commissioner for this area here. Long history in this community and he's always been looking out for you guys. So Gary, thanks. Thank you so much. My name is Gary McGilbrey. I'm the county commissioner for District 20. That includes all of Madison Heights, Pleasant Ridge, South Royal Oak, and South Troy. Um, and before that, I was involved with uh, city government for many, many years. So uh, I'm aware. We, I remember back a few years ago, we had a, another plating company, in fact, on John R., that uh, it ate the cement out of the sewer pipes. And it was just amazing to me that that, that could happen. Uh, and that company was held responsible for that. Uh, that goes back probably 20 years ago, I'm thinking, or thereabouts. I also have the honor to introduce Andre Ducey. Uh, Andre, if you can stand up just so we, everybody knows who you are. There he is. He's County Commissioner for District 1 in Macomb County. And we also have uh, several other Oakland County uh, employees here that's uh, here to answer any questions afterwards if there are any. So thanks for coming. All right, thank you. Uh, we're about ready to begin the program. Um, it's my job to introduce some other elected officials from the region. We have a lot of support from our friends south of Ten Mile, the city of Hazel Park, the friendly city. I want to recognize Mayor Michael Webb, city council members, Mike McFall, Andy Lakiro, Amy Aubrey, former Mayor Jack Lloyd, and City Manager at Klobuchar. Thank you for being here. I also want to recognize uh, the hosts, this venue, the beautiful space, Madison High School. I want to acknowledge the elected school board members, uh, Mark Holcomb, Debbie Ott, Gloria Thompson, and Mark Kimball, and a special recognition to Superintendent, the best in the land, Angel Abdulahead. Thank you. Show of hands so the panelists know who we're talking about. Who's from Madison Heights? Who cares about Madison Heights? Who cares about a clean environment in our beautiful state of Michigan? Thank you very much. All right, it's my last job and my pleasure to introduce our moderator. Our moderator is Michael Watsa, who's donated his time to moderate tonight's discussion. Michael Watsa is an attorney at the Kitsch Firm in Detroit, where he is the chair of the Governmental Regulatory Practice Group. He represents government, nonprofit, and private sector clients in the areas of energy, telecommunications, and legislative consulting. Governors Granholm and Snyder appointed Michael to the Michigan Gaming Control Board. Plus, he has served as special projects counsel to the Michigan Municipal Risk Management Authority. He also serves as an adjunct faculty member at the Michigan State University College of Law, teaching communications law and policy and ethics and practice of law and is presently on the faculty of the Michigan State University Institute for Public Utilities. Michael is an experienced moderator and has volunteered his services tonight to help our residents get answers on the contamination incident on 10 Mile. Please join me in welcoming Michael Watsa to the city of Madison Heights. Michael. I, uh, I believe my job as a trial lawyer, and I think that's why I got the phone call, um, is to get you answers from our panel of experts. So I'm gonna try and do that. I hope I do. Uh, the way we're gonna do that, by the way, is you're gonna fill out those cards. Everybody have a question card? Does anybody not have a question card that wants one? We'll get them to you, because we're gonna do this by written format. The reason we're gonna do it that way is so we have a written record. I'm a lawyer, what can I tell you? We're gonna have a written record. 
I'm going to know every question you've asked, and I'm going to see to it that you get answers. Now, you may not get them all today. Some of them may require some time, but there's a website that's going to be up, and it's going to be available for you to look at, and those questions and answers will be on there. So, um, your job is to write the questions out, and our panel of experts, their job is going to be to answer as much as they humanly can. Um, so let me introduce very quickly our panel. We have uh, Melissa Marsh, way over to my left, city manager for, for, the, for the city of Madison Heights. And I understand she's been here forever, so that's pretty good credentials. Apparently you all know her. And then we have uh, Trish Edwards from the EPA. And then Tracy Kestamet from Eagle, which is the environmental agency from the community. And they're, they're really the hands-on folks. You're going to hear from them mostly tonight. Um, and then we have Corey Gretsch from the DHH, the Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, so, all right, so I've already kind of told you what the format is, but the first thing that's going to happen is this panel on my left and the folks here from the EPA and the uh, uh, state are going to do about a 30-minute presentation for the purpose of bringing all of us up to speed as best they are able, uh, based on questions that have already come in, uh, and get us all on the same, same base, okay? And then, once they're done, or actually while they're doing that, your assignment is to write out really thoughtful questions. And as I would tell students, when you get that card in your hand, don't start writing. Think first, then write. Anyway, so do it that way. Turn in the cards to these nice young people walking up and down the aisles, and then I will read them, and I will do my best uh, as an officer of the court and a lawyer to get the best answers we can from these folks. How's that? All right. Well, hopefully that works. So um, with that said, why don't our panel start their presentation? Good evening. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. So I apologize. I'm not able to sit while I talk, so I'm probably going to stand over here. Can, if I stand here, can everybody still see the slides? Okay. So good evening, everyone. Uh, like Mike said, my name is Tracy Cascometti. I work for the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. You will hear us call that EGLE. Right. So we're the state agency responsible for implementing environmental laws here in the state. Many of those laws are delegated to us from the federal government. Some of those are state specific. Um, we have district offices across the state and I work here out of our Warren district office. I've worked in that office for almost 19 years. Uh, we cover Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, and St. Clair counties. Um, and I say that so that you know that, you know, I'm here in your community. I am not a spokesperson from Lansing. I am a person who works out of the district office and I do this work every day to serve our communities. And also, I'm from this community. You know, I've lived in Oakland County for almost 20 years. I grew up in Wayne County, so I am a, I'm a Metro Detroiter, and I understand the concerns that you guys feel when you have a situation like this come to your community. Because for as much as I've spent my career working in environmental pollution and environmental cleanup, I understand that when this comes to your community for the first time, this is, you know, this is new to many of you. I'm sure that a lot of you followed the Flint water crisis in the news, you're following the PFAS crisis in the news, but this may be the first time that something has come to your community and hit you this closely. And so I know the kinds of concerns that that can bring out. And you know, um, like Representative Ellison mentioned, the Facebook page is great. I read every post, I read every comment, I read all of the questions that you have compiled and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to be engaged. I mean, I recognize it takes a lot of effort for you to participate. You know, for you to come tonight to educate yourself, to learn this information, to participate in your government. So thank you all for coming here. Um, I guess the last thing I want to mention is that, you know, I do take your concerns seriously. Um, I know that when something like this happens in your community, you're worried, is your water safe? Is your air safe? Are your kids safe? You know, and, and like I said, I live here too. You know, I feed my kids, you know, I, I give my kids the same water that you give your kids. You know, so, you know. 
When I come into a situation like this, I know that trust in government is low these days, and I know that uh, trust in the agency I work for is specifically low. Okay, that is not lost on me. I understand that every time I come to a forum like this, I'm working in the shadow of the Flint water crisis, right? And I understand that, that trust is low, right? So I'm just gonna address that right off the bat. So, you know, I'm here to answer any of your questions, to share with you everything I know about this situation and get you answers to any of the questions that you have. And we do that in an effort to try to rebuild that trust, right? So I will be as, as honest and open with you and share with you any information I have. Um, but with that, let's, let's just get into it, all right? So I'm gonna give you an update on the electroplating <laughs> services situation in Madison Heights, which you all know why you're here. I'm gonna start with a timeline. Uh, I'm gonna focus on what I consider the recent history. Uh, back to 2016. I recognize that we have a long history at this site, back to the mid-90s. And uh, we're not gonna go through uh, that timeline here tonight. I think many of you have seen where it's posted online. We have a frequently asked questions document out on the table. And it documents decades of attempts to bring this site into compliance through criminal prosecution, through administrative penalties, entering consent orders. We got the site cleaned up once. But frankly, all of that shows that, you know, that was not enough, right? It was our traditional means of, of working with businesses were not effective on a site like Electroplating Services and an operator like Gary Sayers. So I think we can all agree that more should have been done sooner, um, but short of going into a year-by-year -year detail of what happened in the 90s and the early 2000s, I'm gonna focus on recent history from 2016 forward. Um, so that's when we got the complaint from the city of Madison Heights, their fire and building officials went in and they called us and they said, you know, there are some, some really serious chemical hazards in this building and we're really concerned with the waste management and the conditions in the property. We went in, we did an inspection and, and uh, the next day, I think it was May 13th, 2016, and the building was barely passable. I mean, our staff couldn't get in the door to do a full thorough inspection. But from the door, we could see enough to say, uh, there's really significant mismanagement of chemicals here, and we put the owner on notice that he had to remedy that situation. He was responsible for that. Gary Sayers is responsible for the contamination on this property. This was an operating business. He was responsible for properly managing his waste offsite. He was not doing that. Um, but what we have found is that it is typically most efficient uh, to make the responsible party take responsibility for their waste, right? and to tell them, you have this obligation. So we issued that first notice and we said, you need to clean this up. And it seemed at first that he made a couple of good faith efforts. He, uh, he hired a reputable waste management firm, he had a reputable environmental attorney that was meeting with us and it seemed like maybe we we're gonna make some progress. But as we got through the summer and into the fall, it became really apparent that uh, he either lacked the will or the means to do this. And so we changed course of strategy and we issued a cease and desist order. You know, this was not an, uh, an abandoned business. This was not an abandoned building full of waste. He was operating a plating shop. He had a handful of employees, and we issued a cease and desist order and shut his business down in December of 2016. Um, I believe that was the third time in the history of our state's hazardous waste law that we've taken that action to issue a cease and desist order. It's not a provision that we use lightly or, or frequently, but in this case, literally nothing else was working. Um, throughout 2017, um, the Environmental Protection Agency came in and did a cleanup. As soon as we issued that cease and desist order, we were ready with a referral to the US EPA. It said, you know, somebody needs to come in and get this site cleaned up. The state does not have the capabilities that the EPA has to do these uh, emergency or what they call a time critical removal. And so that was referred to the EPA and they spent 2017 doing that cleanup. At the same time, our state and federal criminal investigators got to work on building an enforcement case against Gary Sayers. Um, he eventually, in 2019, pled guilty to federal uh, criminal charges for hazardous waste management and was sentenced to a year in federal prison, which is where he sits today. Yay! And, you know, and I know I've heard from many people, you know, just a year, you know, or, or just a small penalty, and I will tell you, it is, it is very uncommon to get uh, jail time for an environmental, you know, for an environmental violator. So, um, so you know, the the criminal plea and the sentencing was in uh, November of 2019. In the mid in the meantime, there between when EPA was done with their removal action, 
we got to work assessing the site to see if it met the criteria for what we call the super fun list. And I'm, I'm gonna talk more about this. I just wanna run through the timeline here. Um, and then December 20th, 2019, while most of us were uh, packing up at the office, getting ready for holiday, for a few days off over the holidays, uh, the release was observed on the side of the highway. And Trisha's gonna talk all about the nuts and bolts of that cleanup that's happening. So I'm gonna spend more of my time going over how did this happen? What do we know about where the contamination is moving? What does that mean for our community and that sort of thing? And then Trisha's gonna uh, come up next and give a, give a slideshow on the actual cleanup. So when we went into the building in early 2016, uh, these are some of the conditions that we saw. So this is before EPA came in and did their removal action. Uh, many of you that are following this in the news have heard about the basement pit, right? This is the pit in the basement. So you can see it has uh, concrete sidewalls here, but beneath that, that level, it's dirt. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an earthen bottom, right? So he dug it out into the clay. And actually there's sort of like this shelf that goes around and that's actually part of it, a part of the pit as well. And this is sort of like a sump in the middle. And so what happened, this is like a, a multi-story building. It's two buildings uh, sort of next to each other that it's almost like a split level. So on this side of the building, there's a very shallow basement, and the plating floor is above this basement. Um, and so his plating baths sat right above this, and all the, all the slop and all the you know, splash would flow over the sides of the tanks and down into this basement pit. I mean, it had, I don't think I have pictures of all of the conditions on the plating bath floor, but it had eaten away the walkways between the plating baths. I mean, this is, uh, you know, you can see just liquid on the floor here. This has just flowed from above down into the basement. This is pretty representative of how he was storing containers. This in the upper corner here, you can see, you know, just sludge on the floor. This is hazardous waste filter kink that he has, has just stored, you know, piled up on the floor. <coughs> this bottom picture, I'm sorry, is a little dark, but I wanted to show you, you know, container storage in the building, you know, so just drums haphazardly stored. I mean, really the conditions we walked into was like a chemical hoarding situation. And our, our main concern with it um, was that incompatible chemicals were stored near each other. Um, many things were unlabeled, they were unknown what their contents were, and there were chemicals that were stored together um, that had there been a release, there could have been a really dangerous air quality problem in the community. The building was open to trespass, he was missing an overhead door coming into the plant, uh, there was no fencing, the site was not secure. So we worked with the Department of Health and Human Services and we made a determination that this pr property, this operation, posed an imminent substantial threat to the public health. And that's how we were able to get that cease and desist order. The provision in the law for cease and desist is not that someone's being uncooperative, it's not that they're a repeated violator. The provision is if they are posing an imminent and substantial threat to public health. And so we were able to determine because of the incompatibles and the unknowns and the conditions and the, you know, open to trespass that this property sort of met that threshold. But we're asked a lot of times, you know, well, why don't you shut down more chronic violators? It's, it's a very high threshold to meet to, to shut down an operating business. So when we refer to the US EPA, one of the things I hear often from folks and I've seen on the Facebook page is, uh, did you know they didn't clean it up right? You know, did you know they didn't finish the cleanup? And you have to keep in mind what the, what the removal was intended to do. So we, we were most concerned with the chemical storage conditions inside the building. And we, uh, we referred that to the EPA to do what they call a time critical removal. They come in and they abate the immediate hazard, okay? They were not, the, that cleanup action was not intended to leave the property clean. It was not intended to address long-term soil and groundwater contamination. It was intended to come in and remove the immediate chemical hazard that had that material been abandoned, had it been, you know, had the building collapsed, had there been a fire, there could have been a dangerous air plume in the community, um, you know, trespassers were at risk. The intention of that EPA cleanup was to remove that immediate hazard. It was not to address soil and groundwater contamination. So when you read comments like, well, why didn't they clean it up right the first time? They cleaned it up to, to abate the emergency, okay? But the soil, long term, the long term problem was referred back to the state. So after EPA was done with their cleanup, this is sort of a quick picture of uh, that pit. 
you know, they cleaned out the they cleaned out the liquid and they backfilled it with stone to abate the you know fall hazard and whatnot. After EPA finished their removal action, we did what's called a, a super fund or a CERCLA, CERCLA is the name of the law, preliminary assessment. This is where we look at a, a contaminated property and we essentially rank it to see if it meets that threshold for federal super fund status. Some of you have probably heard this term super fund, right? It's a, it's a federal program for cleaning up our most contaminated sites. It's not a bank account that's addressed, you know, that we use for every contaminated property we have. It is for our most contaminated sites. And so you have to go through this ranking system where you assess all the different ways that this contamination can affect people and the environment, and you score it, essentially. Well, thankfully, because all of us are in municipal water in this area, and this was not affecting anybody's drinking water, it did not score very high. And so it did not meet that status for becoming a national Superfund site. Um, so this is what we were working on through 2018. Those recommendations were made to EPA in 2019 that you know, this site does not score uh, high enough for Superfund. Um, and we were going to have to, you know, it was essentially going to join the ranks of thousands of other contaminated properties we have awaiting a long-term solution. Here in Southeast Michigan, we have about 9,000 contaminated properties um, across Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, and St. Clair County. Um, our remediation staff are able to work on about 10% of those, right? So we've got maybe 60 sites right now that are uh, being addressed under state-funded cleanup, and our remediation staff work with about 700 other sites where the responsible party is doing the cleanup, but that is out of 9,000 sites, okay? So, um, with the resources we have and the staff we have, um, that's, I just want to paint the picture for you. Right? I just want to put in perspective, you know, this site was, was joining those ranks. And sort of rightfully so, you know, we are thankful that uh, everyone in this area is on municipal water. If this site was located in an area where there was sandy soil and people were drinking the groundwater, this would have been a much more serious situation for public health. So that sort of brings us to December 20th, 2019. Um, you know, we, through 2018, 2019, we were continuing to work with the city of Madison Heights and looking for a solution. Um, I have recognized that situation, that process was not moving very fast. And that's not very satisfying. And on December 20th, this, this is what was observed on the side of the road. And so I think we've all seen this picture and our staff responded that day. And uh, it was not very hard to trace it to its source. I just grabbed this picture off of Google Earth. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Um, these wet spots on the concrete, the middle one, oh, where's my pointer? The middle one is where the green frozen water was coming out this past December. But if you just look right up the hill, this is electroplating services. Uh, you know, and, and from an environmental perspective, most environmental professionals looked at this and looked at the plating shop at the top of the hill and they said, well, that's hexavalent chromium. That's what turns the water green. And so it was not a big mystery that night what it was. Um, but that night we responded, we, we, got a, we got a hold of the fire, the fire chief was the first call we made. And we said, you know, there's a situation in electroplating services. We got out there, we assessed it. We thought, you know, this is gonna exceed our cleanup capabilities at the state. And we immediately called US EPA and they deployed that night uh, to start the cleanup. I wanna spend a little bit of time on this drawing um, to explain to you what's happening. And bear with me because this is a, a digitized version of a, a hand drawing that I made and I am not, I'm neither artist nor geologist, okay? So this is my, my best rendering of, of how to explain what's going on. So this is the electroplating services building up on the service drive, you know, it's here 10 miles on this side. There's a shallow basement under the building with a, with a pit dug into the floor. At ground level on the service drive, you have about 10 or 11 feet below ground surface, sort of sandy soil. You know, the fill that goes under a road or sort of, you know, natural sandy, sandy soil. And after about 11 feet, you hit really heavy, thick native clay. And below that, for about 100, 140 feet, we have a thick clay layer. So this is why none of us are in wells, because there's no water to be had out of the ground here, right? This is why we're all on, on, on municipal water. So the contamination is moving out of the building and it's migrating north toward the highway. And it's moving through this uh, more permeable shallow layer in this first 11 feet. 
and it's moving toward the expressway. And then, you know, the expressway, as we see, you know, 686 was dug, right, down below grade. And at this location, it's about 18 feet below the, the level of the service drive. And so it's following this path, you know, water follows the path of least resistance. And so it's, it's flowing toward the embankment, and then it essentially gets cut off, right? If the expressway wasn't there, this contamination would have kept moving north, right? But the, the expressway was, you know, it's like a big trench that was cut out to cut off, that cut off this contamination. And so it hits this embankment and it found a utility corridor, an electrical line, and it ran down and it seeped out of the wall here. So this is where we're seeing it down on the shoulder of 696. So when we look at a contamination situation, we have to think about how is this going to get to people, right? How could this contamination affect people? How could it affect public health? How could it get into our environment? So there's a couple of different routes that we think about. As this contamination is moving north, there's a storm sewer that runs right underneath the service drive that's supposed to just carry the rainwater off of the service drive. And it's set down in the ground at about nine or 10 feet. So the contaminated groundwater, as it's moving, starts to seep into that storm sewer underground, right? Because if you've ever seen them before they're laid, they're just those big concrete pipes and they're fitted together. They're not caulked, they're not sealed, that pipe's not under pressure. So the contaminated groundwater can seep in, right? And leak into that storm sewer. That storm sewer that's on the service drive goes underground for about three miles before it daylights into Bear Creek in the city of Warren. And then that, uh, and then Bear Creek eventually hits the Clinton River and out into Lake St. Clair. Some of the contamination keeps going, and you know, we've got contamination coming down the inside of the bank. And when it hits the, the shoulder on 696, it enters a storm sewer that's in the shoulder, right, that carries all the rainwater off of 696. And there's a whole pump station system that runs along 696 and takes all of the drainage from the highway directly into Lake St. Clair about 11 miles away. So uh, that's, that's this box here. So these storm sewers travel about 11 miles and take that rainwater down into Lake St. Clair. So there are two paths where this contamination is leaving the site and getting into our lakes and rivers. We know from testing that we're not seeing contamination moving south toward Hazel, the neighborhood in Hazel Park, which is, which is a very good thing. But what we're seeing is really localized contamination right around the building, um, but these couple of pathways that is found out through these storm sewers. So when we test this water, we find contaminants of concern include hexavalent chromium, which is from his plating process, uh, trichloroethylene, or TCE, which is often used in parts washers. It's what you find at uh, dry cleaners, right? It's a, it's a solvent. Uh, cyanide, which is part of his plating process, and then PFAS. All right, so many of you have been hearing about PFAS in the news. This is our new emerging contaminant that we're starting to find. Uh, PFAS can be associated with plating shops because it was actually required to be used as a health and safety measure. So if you picture a plating bath where there was like a metal solution that you know a guy would have to stand there and dunk a part down into the plating bath, to protect that employee from the fumes coming off of the tank, they put down what was called a mist suppressant. It's like a surfactant, like a foam that goes on the top of that plating tank to protect the worker. Well, that mist suppressant inclu it, in, uh, included PFAS. So this is why we're finding PFAS at plating shops. And so when we tested the groundwater that's migrating off the site, we did find PFAS. So a couple of pictures to show you what's going on out here. Um, just for the ease of your eyes, we took all the numbers off of this chart and we just color coded it. So the green dots are locations where we have sampled the storm sewers and the levels of contaminants are below our water quality standards. Okay, so everything on 10 mile looks pretty good. The catch basins on the service drive to the wet, water flows from the west to the east down, uh, down the service drive. And to the west of him, the storm sewer is pretty clean. But what we found is this contaminated area in the middle. So that supports that graphic I just showed you where the contamination is moving from the building and moving north. And then obviously as we sample downstream, right, we sample the catch basins downstream, the we're finding the contamination has moved downstream. Now, sampling in storm sewers is kind of a tricky thing because the water moves, right? So what you sample in a catch basin today is gonna be in the next catch basin, you know, a couple of hours later. So 
We haven't sampled every one along the way because it's not a static condition, but we've, we've sampled enough to know that, yeah, it has entered our storm sewers. And we know where the storm sewers go. This sh sort of shows you that pathway. The yellow dot is the facility. And like I said, it travels about three miles underground to this blue triangle. That's uh, Mound Road, just south of 12 Mile. If you know where that uh, BP rest stop is, it's right by Taycom. The creek comes out from underground there. That's, it starts to be called, we call it Bear Creek at that location. And then Bear Creek runs into the Red Run Drain. Sorry, I lost my pointer. Up into the Clinton River and out into Lake St. Clair. Another one of my homemade maps. I appreciate you guys bearing with me on my artistic skills. But um, so the blue lines here show those pathways, right? This is the pathway Bear Creek would take. The more straight one is the pathway that the storm sewers on 696 would take. The yellow dots, or I guess they're uh, thumbtacks, those are locations where we draw drinking water out of our Great Lakes system. So the city of Mount Clemens has a water intake right by the Clinton River spillway. Um, which is right where uh, the, the natural channel, the Clinton River, comes out. Gross Point Farms has an intake here at the bottom of Lake St. Clair. Most of your water comes out of this intake right here. This is the Great Lakes Water Authority, the Belle Isle intake. That services most of southern Oakland County. Um, so your intake is downstream of where this contamination is entering the lake. We have not sampled out in the lake. So it would literally be like a needle, needle in a haystack, right? I mean, I could go and take one scoop of water out of Lake St. Clair and it just really wouldn't tell us very much. But we've done some modeling on this. We know the concentrations that are leaving the facility. We've assumed the worst case scenarios and run all of the calculations. And the engineers tell me that by the time these contaminants hit the lake, they'd be more than 200 times less than our most stringent water quality standards. So. None of this is to say that this pollution entering the lake is okay or that any of us are comfortable with it, but it's, it, it's not expected to hit the lake in any concentration that would impact water quality. We do have samples from, let's see, this spot at Bear Creek right here. We sampled that. That sort of represents your worst case surface water sample because it's the closest to the site in the smallest stream, right? So we've sampled that location. And we found that hexavalent chromium, cyanide, TCE, those industrial chemicals are all less than our water quality standards. So I think Bear Creek represents the worst case scenario and the, uh, the results are all below water quality standards, except for PFAS. Um, many of you know PFAS, PFAS is a family of chemicals. The one that most, uh, most commonly drives our water quality concerns is PFOS. PFOS at this outfall of Bear Creek was just slightly above. It was not sky high. It was not, uh, you know, it was not at like alarming levels. I think the criteria is 12 and I think it was at 18. Um, but that's what we're seeing in our surface waters. I mean, this is our drinking water intakes. But just to be sure, right, because we know there's a lot of public concern and uh, frankly, I, I understand the concern, right? I understand the lack of trust. I understand I can't say, well, I did the calculation, so it's probably fine, right? And I understand that does not make a lot of, my math does not make a lot of people comfortable. Um, so different water supplies have sampled their water. Now, this is not sampling that Eagle did. This is not sampling that EPA did. The city of Madison Heights sampled seven different locations for chromium, uh, cyanide, TCE, and PFAS at seven different locations. All of those results came back well, well below the relevant criteria. Great Lakes Water Authority, they operate three water intakes, one on Lake Huron, that one in Belle Isle that I showed you where most of your water comes from, and then another one down on, uh, down on Fighting Island right down here near Wyandotte. Those three water intakes serve five different water treatment plants where the water comes in and is filtered and disinfected before it's sent out into your system. They sampled all five of those locations and all of the results were well below criteria. Same with Gross Point Farms in the city of Wyandotte. And when I say well below criteria, the criteria for chromium is 100 parts per billion. The results we got ranged from 0.09 to 0.3. I mean, less than one part per billion. Okay, so we're like one one hundredth of the, of the criteria. So 
when I say well below the criteria, I mean well, well below the criteria. And, and, the, and the important thing too is all those results were consistent. We saw the same things in Wyandotte that we're seeing in Gross Point Farms. I mean, there are small, small detections of these chemicals, but all at consistent levels. Um, you know, when we think about whether or not our drinking water system could be impacted by a situation of contamination, there's kind of two ways I think that could happen. Something could get out into the river and pulled into one of these intakes, right? Or your water pipes are laying in the ground, right? And people worry, well, could this contamination in the ground seep into my water pipe? And so this is the sampling that Madison Heights did. This shows the locations that they sampled their water system. Uh, a 10 mile road here between these two locations, uh, electroplating services is between those two locations. So you got one sample upstream and one sample downstream. They also sampled in Hazel Park and Royal Oak to get sort of a, a distribution across the area. And all the results came back consistently in that 0 0.2, 0 0.3 range. And I also I just want to point out, it, it's, it's just really unlikely that contamination would seep into your water pipes. These water pipes are made out of cast iron and they are under pressure. Okay, so water pipes in the ground are not particularly vulnerable to contamination. They're constructed that way for a reason, right? Because we know that sometimes there are unidentified situations, right? Where there's contamination that we don't know about, but our, I want you to understand your water distribution system is not particularly vulnerable to contamination. There's one more pathway that we think about, though, that's maybe not quite as obvious, and it's called vapor intrusion. Uh, has anyone here sampled their house for radon? Yeah? Uh, more hands should be in the air for sure, okay? so. Uh, take nothing away from tonight, even if you don't have a basement, please sample your house for radon. Uh, but vapor intrusion is the same concept, right? It's that um, a dangerous gas could be entering your house through your foundation. So what can happen is if something like TCE or gasoline uh, contaminates the groundwater, we call those volatile compounds, right? They can evaporate easily. So if you ever spill gasoline, you know how you see like the haze, right? You can see it evaporating. That happens when those chemicals are in the groundwater but it's evaporating into the soil, and then it moves through the soil, the, sort of the vapor moves through the soil like a soil gas, and it can enter your house through cracks in the foundation or through you know, a sump or your basement walls or whatever. So anytime we have contamination of something like TCE or gasoline, vapor intrusion is another pathway that we think about when we think, okay, does this incident of contamination affect people? So to, to evaluate that, we look at groundwater. And again, this is just uh, red is above, green is below criteria map. This is a uh, groundwater sampling that the EPA did. And what this shows us, again, the red dots localized right around the building and off to that expressway. What it shows us is that we have localized contamination around the building. Sorry, the arrow and the light don't go in the same place. Can you guys understand? Uh, so you have localized contamination right around the building. But importantly, what you have is this row of clean groundwater right here on the south side of 10 Mile. So EPA went through and put in all these uh, soil borings and, and temporary monitoring wells and collected groundwater from the south side of 10 Mile. Because if you can picture it, there's a neighborhood right here in Hazel Park, right? That's the closest neighborhood is to the south. Um, we have a building right here. So this is EPS. These are other Gary Sayers properties. This is that vacant lot in between where you had to tear down a building a few years ago. This is another business. Uh, it's, they have a, they, the buildings almost abut each other. And we have clean groundwater on this side of the building, but we are still concerned about a possible vapor intrusion problem in that building. That is an occupied business. And Trisha's gonna go into this more, but EPA has gone in to do some air sampling in that business to assure the, the safety and the air quality of, of that business. But um, those sort of round out the pathways that we think about when there's a contamination situation and we say, okay, you know, like, like many of the, uh, the speakers talked about early on, it's not great that we have to prioritize and triage these sites of contamination. But with limited resources and thousands and thousands of sites, this is the kind of prioritization that happens. Um, so we go through this list. Is it affecting anyone's drinking water? Is it going to affect water quality? Is it going to pose a vapor intrusion hazard? And because the answer on these is primarily no, this is why it didn't score to be a super fun site. This is why this is not joining the worst of the worst of the, of the environmental contamination sites. So, like I said, you know, in this area, we are 
sort of blessed by a lot of clay and municipal water. If this site was located in Grand Rapids where it's all sand and everybody's on a well, there would be a much different public health situation here. I think I'm going to save this because I feel like I've been talking for a long time. I know this is going to come up in the questions. There's been a lot of questions about how did this happen, what is the regulatory oversight, but I know that Mike will not let me off the hook without talking about those things, so I'm going to, I'm going to skip over this one. And I just want to talk about next steps briefly. I mean, we've been focused since December 20th on addressing the, the contamination, but like I've said many times, it's a Band-Aid, right? EPA out there pumping the water, this is a temporary solution, this is not a long-term solution. So we're still figuring out if we have any additional enforcement options against Gary Sayers. He's sitting in federal prison, but we need to evaluate whether or not there's any additional enforcement that can be done there. Um, but we also need to work with the City of Madison Heights and, and EPA and find a long-term solution for this building. Um, in this contamination. Um, and then Governor Whitmer has asked that EGLE uh, conduct a review of our pollution inspection procedures to see what improvements can be done, right? To, to see if there's anything we can do with our processes, with, our, with, with the resources that we already have, what can we do better? And we think that there are some opportunities, right, to improve our processes so that a site like this that threw up as many red flags as this site threw up would not fall in the cracks again. And, the, and that is all aside from the things that your you know, elected officials are doing to propose you know, new policy, new funding, but we're looking at what can we do with what we have, and we're bringing in a third party uh, you know, facilitator to do that kind of review. Um, and so we should have some recommendations coming out of that process this year. Um, I would just offer that if you have any questions about this situation or any other environmental question, we do have a hotline and assistance center. That's this number up here. Uh, we are posting all of the information about this incident to the main page of our website. So if you just go to michigan.gov slash eagle, you scroll to the bottom, there's an icon for contamination investigations. You click on that and it takes you to all the information we have about this site. And then uh, Corey Gretsch is here from the Department of Health and Human Services and they run a hotline that I really like to give to people if you ever have any questions about health effects, uh, environmental exposures and, and health concerns, you can call this number and get in touch with a toxicologist. So it's 1-800-MI-TOXIC. Okay, I think I've talked enough. I'm gonna turn it over to Trisha so she can go through uh, some specifics on the cleanup. Melissa, do we have to do anything on the machine? Corey's got it. And then we'll answer all of your questions. So thank you for your attention. I know I talked a lot. Uh, This is being live streamed on Facebook Live. So be good or your kids will be laughing at you when you get home. And we have a hard stop at 8 o'clock. So I think we can get through the questions I've got so far at least by 8 o'clock. But um, just so you know, 8 o'clock, we have to get out of here. Uh, good evening, my name is Trish Edwards, uh, I'm an on coordinator with the US EPA. Uh, Tracy's a tough act to follow, so um, I'm a field person, so yeah, bear with me throughout this uh, presentation. So I too, like Tracy, uh, I live in Southeast Michigan, uh, born and raised, uh, went to the University of Michigan, 
been with the EPA for 12 years. Today's my anniversary. Um, so <laughs> I'm happy to serve you. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor to, to serve this community even when we have uh, challenges like this. Um, so Tracy touched on the first removal action that took place um, that EPA conducted. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of go through my photos pretty quick because I want to leave us plenty of time for pictures or um, for questions. But just to touch on a few um, few things, I was not the uh, lead OSC for that for that removal action, um, but we did come in and we removed that imminent threat. Right, that was our goal when we uh, when we when I, we did our response. So just a few photos. When Tracy and I went through our presentations earlier, um, I thought our pictures kind of complemented each other pretty well. So in this uh, in this example here, these are some of the vats that he had. Um, still in place at the facility that still had chemicals and still um, it was operational when they um, shut it down. These photos are, um, are actually, it looks pretty organized, but that's because our crew had come in and started organizing them to be sampled. Um, but this, this is, um, sorry, this, this photo, there were just lockers full of these small chemicals um, in small containers that had to be lab packed. So it was very intense cleanup um, that obviously took you know over ten months. Upon completion of the removal of all of the chemicals um, and the removal of that imminent threat, the idea was um, we typically would remove the, the containers as well, the vats, I should say, the small containers. Over five thousand containers were were removed from the site and. Uh, over almost 40,000 gallons of hazardous liquid was removed from the site. And in these vats, the, the, the vats were emptied of the materials, they were cleaned, and then they were rendered inoperable. Now, like I said, normally when we um, conduct a removal at a planning facility, we would take those vats out as well. But as a property owner, Mr. Stair still had rights to those to that property and he felt that there was value in it. So there's a lot of questions, why are there so many containers still left? They're still there because they're metal and he found value to that. So there, there's some issues. So that's why they're still left in place. But you can see that, you know, we, the containers have been cleaned, the floors have been swept and the thousands of containers that were strewn about the building that Tracy had mentioned you can only cut paths through were removed from the facility. Um, I'm going to move now to fast forward to December 20th. Um, on, the e on the late afternoon on December 20th, I was uh, returning home from a site in Ohio and got a call from um, Eagle. It requested our assistance um, on site. So we immediately mobilized to the site, um, mobilized our, by contractors uh, to assist with the, with the removal action. Um, so that evening, our focus was uh, primarily to, well, we worked with Oakland County, um, Hazmat team was on site, Madison Heights Fire, Eagle, um, MDOT, everybody, you know, came together in the initial response phase of this. Um, it was, it was a great, it was a great uh, cooperation event that evening. It was, it was fantastic. Oakland County had done air monitoring for us. Um, to ensure that we didn't have any uh, potential air issues. Hexavalent chromium typically doesn't have any issues for, um, for air to, in this state, but we still had um, at Oakland County, or I should say, Oakland County was still there to ensure that for us. <coughs> that evening, how it is, this picture's a little bit dark, we um, mobilized a small excavator so that we could remove that ice from an embankment remove it from what was um, on, the, on the shoulder of uh, 696. We also mobilized a vac truck to the site uh, and a large tank, which you probably hear us call a frack tank all the time. So a frack tank is a tank that you also see it on the side of 696. It's over 20,000 gallons and it gives us the ability to store liquid on site while we determine what we really have. Um, so. That evening, we mobilized all of that equipment so that we could um, get everything handled and at least start to get everything handled. So the ice was containerized and moved up towards the EPS facility. 
the liquids in those catch basins on, on I-696 were vacuumed, and the, the liquids in the basement that had accumulated were approximately three inches thick over that photo that Tracy had showed earlier of the gravel that was in that basement. It was over three inches um, of, of liquid that we went in and started to, uh, to remove. The very next morning, uh, we started uh, in on the devising a plan as to how we were gonna maintain this groundwater um, and, and try to get it back to the site so that we weren't continuing to have it flow away from the site. Um, the contractors, thankfully, that I had on site were actually the same contractors that conducted the removal a couple of years ago. So they had a lot of knowledge of the site. And they knew exactly where to go into this site and actually start to install this sump. So we knew that we had to do something as quickly as possible. So we um, brought in, this is called a little dingo. It's got an auger bit on it. And we used the auger as best as we can. But it was so saturated with liquid most of it had to be hand dug. And as Tracy mentioned, you can tell it too from the photos, it's, got, it's kind of a, it's a smaller space, um, kind of like a half basement. So um, from, from ground surface, what would be normal ground surface outside the building, to uh, the depth in which we dug the sump was pro is probably about 11 feet deep. In this first picture, you can see it was nothing fancy, right? Like we were there to get this water under control as quickly as possible. So we dug that sump and we installed a, a submersible pump that had a float on it, similar to what you may have in your, in your basement. And we plumbed that and we, we, we ran the discharge hose out to our frack tank so that all of that water could be pumped 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and into that frack tank so that we could manage it. So we could try to manage any additional water from, from getting off site. We knew we had an uphill battle, uh, so <laughs> that was just our first, our first step amongst many. Um, the next two photos are just uh, a little bit more advanced. Uh, they're just put in a drum, and really it's kind of a two-phase pumping system. The reason behind that is because of the cold weather. The idea is we'll pump it from one into the other. So there's more pumping. We really just want to avoid freezing within, within the system. The next phase was installing a sump on the embankment. Um, we, were really, uh, we were really having a hard time. Um, the temperatures were, were, were a little bit warmer. Uh, they had been really cold up until this point. We got a little bit of warmth. We started to see a little bit of that thaw. And we were having a hard time managing the water that was in that bank of embankment. And so what you saw, and, and Tracy showed a photo of the, the barrier wall along 696 and gave you that perspective to where the building was. So those three joints between those concrete barriers, they continued to weep. And so we needed to do something so that we could contain that and try to capture as much of that uh, liquid before um, it, it got away from us and out of those, those concrete joints. So we installed this sump. Um, we, were we didn't want to do anything too drastic, right? So we're on a very steep embankment um, on 696 there. And so this, this sump isn't very deep. Um, it's only about, like I say, three to four feet deep. It has holes dug around, uh, or uh, holes around basically like a, a, a drum and then it's set into, into the uh, embankment. And as you can see, there's uh, river rock and then pea gravel around it. And it allows that, that water to freely come into that sump. And just like the basement, we used another submersible pump in which the, there's a float on it, and then it's plumbed to a frack tank on the side of 696. So this continues, just like the one in the basement, operates 24-7 and it's plumbed into this frack tank uh, so, that, so that we can continue to maintain that. We've also sealed the joints in between each of those barrier walls to, to avoid any, uh, any further loss. So as soon as we could get in, uh, in equipment, uh, we wanted to start our subsurface investigation. Uh, 
this is a very complicated site. Uh, we know that we had, when we started getting onto this site, we found out we knew we had an electrical line that ran across the, across the service drive and down the exit ramp and down the embankment. But then we found out, working with the city, that we had a water main, we had storm sewer, we had a sanitary sewer, and we had fiber optics. Um, so between MDOT and the city feeding us information, we found out how much more complicated this is. So um, we were very cautiously, we, we of course brought in Ms. Dig, but we did ground penetrating radar to identify anything uh, beneath the ground surface we had to be aware of. And then we started doing soil borings. And Tracy talked a lot about our soil, our soil samples and our groundwater samples. And basically these soil borings are about two inch in diameter and they drive down to that clay layer that Tracy talked about, the one that's at about 11 feet. So that, it varies a little bit. It's probably between 11 and 15 feet for the most part in our area of concern. And basically we pull out a core and it gives us basically a snapshot of what it looks like um, beneath the ground surface. And so we can identify if we have sandy soils and what types of soils we have, but we can also take samples of those soils and determine what kind of contamination is there. Then once that core is removed, we put in, uh, we put in, it's called, it's a slotted screen, but imagine a straw with a bunch of little uh, slices in it that allows water to flow into that, into that uh, straw, I'm gonna like this. And then what we use is we can, we can use different pumps or balers and we can pull those water samples. So that's how we get the groundwater samples. So we may have put in this screen down to that competent clay, but now we're getting that water that we're concerned about, that water that we wanna know whether or not is contaminated. So that's how we go ahead and determine what's in that, in that area that's contaminated. So these are some examples, um, just some of the photos. This is a recovery well on site. <coughs> this is actually on, on the EPS property. This was an existing, what we call a recovery well, an existing well that's on the site. And you can see this is very bright yellow. This is samples of the, of the material that came from this recovery well. Um, the other photo is a picture of them sampling the, the, catch big, the storm sewer. Those were not yellow, um, thankfully. So what does this all mean, right? So it's, it's, we've got all of this data, and I know this map is busy, but it's part of the reason I, want, I wanted to include it. Because we've been busy, and we've been trying to identify where our contamination is. And Tracy did a great job showing you some of the things along, along uh, 10 mile here, these samples. She showed you those green dots that showed us that we're clear, that we've got good samples on 10 mile. But we've also, so we've consolidated a lot of sampling in this area. Um, this yellow line right there, that's where the leaf was. So we've consolidated a ton of sampling. So we want to determine, we want to study this, we want to understand how that groundwater is flowing. So that's, that's what our charge has been. This is a 3D example of, uh, of, of the soil borings that we have, this dark, dark layer is that competent clay. So back here is, this is where our interceptor trench is. But you can see here's one of the, one of the, uh, this is the storm line. Here's the electrical that comes down. This is the sump that we have in play. Um, so we're utilizing this 3D model to help us make some determinations. But basically what those determinations helped us and those samples helped us decide was we had some big problems that we had to deal with, right? We knew that we had things on 696 and we kind of got those under control with the sump at the, at the base of the embankment. But what we also had was we had identified there was contamination in that storm sewer. The storm sewer that Tracy told you runs to Bear Creek. So in an effort to halt that and maintain that, that contamination on site within that area, what we did was we installed a, a, what we call a bypass system. So if I go back to this photo, back here I've got storm, storm catch basin here. I've got one here, I've got one here. So 
So basically, we've got clean water that comes down this, this storm drain, and then we plugged this storm drain, and then we ran piping all the way around, and then we discharge it at this, at this, at this downstream end. So this is just a photo uh, of, of that pumping system. So up here is the pumps, and then you can see these pipes that run all the way down here, and they run all the way down the service drive, and then they discharge at the far end. So what we have is in that center area, we have um, the potential for that, that contaminated groundwater is, is, my, is, uh, is entering that storm sewer. So now we have the ability to capture that groundwater and we can, we can send it off for disposal and so that it, it's managed. Until we can manage the rest of the site, now we're trying to at least not, we don't want to introduce clean water into an area and then have it become contaminated water. It also increases how much more we have to dispose of, or we have a potential for more uh, contamination going downstream. The other big thing that was decided was uh, we installed an interceptor trench. And this has been very valuable to us. Based on the, the flow of that contamination, the interceptor trench was, um, was decided upon. This photo is just show you a little bit of the concrete cutting and the, the removal of the, uh, the asphalt. As we talked about that competent clay layer, so this interceptor trench was dug to, to, um, to that competent clay layer, to that 11 feet. And then piping was, all of the soil was removed, that was removed was placed in line roll off boxes. Uh, they're still pending disposal. But then this pipe, this 36 inch pipe that's here has holes in it. A lot, basically like the sump that I, that I have in the basement, basically like the sump that we have on that on the embankment wall, but it was lowered down 11 feet to that clay. And then from there, we had drain tile, which is basically a smaller version of this pipe with a bunch of holes in it, runs off uh, like arms, and it's gradually sloped back to this sump. And again, we've ins installed uh, a sump with a float on it that automatically, as the water comes in, it immediately kicks that pump on and it transfers it to that frac tank so that we're managing that groundwater and we're, we're, we're trying to prohibit it from making it across that service drive and down the embankment. Within, a, within just a few days time, those monitoring wells that we had put on the embankment, we saw the groundwater drop one foot. So we know we're bringing that water towards our interceptor trench. So we were really, we we're really happy to see that it was working Tracy was nice enough to have this made up for me. So this was the sump, um, as we said, this is pumped into the frac tank. This is again, this is uh, another example how the interceptor trench is pumped into the frac tank. And again, how it's managed down on the, uh, on the highway. So this interceptor trench is, is twofold. We're, we just resampled the storm sewer. So we wanna make sure that we're starting to see less migration of that contamination entering that storm sewer. So we just sampled it again, so in, in our, um, our analytical results appears that our trench is really working and doing the job that we want it to do. <coughs> but this is what we got in that trench. This is what showed up in less than, in less than 24 hours. We had yellow liquid filling our trench. Not what we, Ideally, not what we wanted to see, but it was doing what we needed it to do. So it's capturing that contaminated groundwater like we wanted. Lastly, um, Tracy talked about the, the, the sampling that we were doing, that Baker intrusion pathway. These are just a couple examples of, um, or a couple photos of what we did inside the, the neighboring facility. Basically, we did some indoor air sampling. Um, these are a little hard to tell. There's a, there's a, a canister there. But so we put in vapor pins, so they drill, we drill a hole through the slab of the facility, and we put in these little these vapor pins, and we draw air from beneath the, um, the slab of the facility over a 24 hour period. And then we also have those seed canisters that we just put throughout, uh, strategically throughout the building, so it captures the indoor air in that building. 
So it'll give us a good snapshot of what we can see in a 24 hour period and determine if we have contamination and we have to take additional steps. We don't have that analytical yet, um, but we're working with that facility and we'll share it with them as soon as we get it. So to date, um, we have collected over uh, 63,000 gallons on site. Um, 47,000 of that has been shipped off site for disposal. Um, you can see there's 16,000 gallons that remain on the frack tanks, but those are regularly shipped off site for, for uh, disposal. So we're shipping a lot of waste off site. Um, this is just a 3D model. I'm not sure how well it works um, here, but just, uh, just to give you a good perspective of here's the facility, the trenches within this area, lots of sampling all the way throughout here and along the, um, along the wall, and then the sump here. Um, so the next steps. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of answers for the next steps. We're still evaluating a lot of the data that we got um, and that we're still conducting um, additional sampling. Uh, we're actually planning on doing uh, a bunch of sampling next week, and uh, we're continuing to, well, we have a multidisciplinary team of engineers um, from the civil side, geologists, chemical engineers working with us to, uh, to develop a plan that, that hopefully we can use long term. So it's, it's complicated, as I mentioned, it's complicated, not just the utilities, but we're, uh, you know, working with, uh, we'll be, we will be working with MDOT and with Eagle so that we make sure that, uh, and with, if we have to discharge it, all of the different authorities that would be involved. So it's gonna be um, a complicated process, but we're, uh, we're working on it together as a team. Um, I know in some of the photos, or I'm sorry, in some of the questions we received, some folks have been looking at our interactive mapper. Um, it's available on our website. If you even just Google EPA electroplating services, this will pop up. And then you'll find a link to our interactive mapper there. We're gonna continue to update, update that so you can actually see the analytical results. You'll see the spots where we've taken samples and what those samples were taken for. Um, so we'll share all of our information that we have. Thank you, panel. Are we done with the panel for the moment? Okay, great. Thank you for all the information. How are we doing on temperature in the room? Is it hot? So, I, I, so something happened when I turned 60, people started talking softly. I, I don't know why, but I asked them to turn the fans off because I couldn't hear anything. Uh, so if we can maybe do something about the temperature and keep people awake. we got about 30 more minutes, so let's see how fast I can go through these questions. Um, do we have any idea what the accumulated cost of handling this situation is to the moment from all agencies or any agencies? Or whatever, whatever information you have at the moment that you can follow up on later. Okay. No idea right now. <coughs> okay. Uh, all right. Well, let's keep. Let's do this. So, uh, I, I, I thought your questions were excellent. By the way, there wasn't a lot of. I mean, obviously, you, anybody who lives anywhere near this is unhappy. But um, I just would remind folks that nobody in this room, nobody, caused this pollution. They didn't dump all those chemicals in that, in that basement. So, so just keep that in mind. These folks are here, like everybody, to learn and disseminate information as best they can. When you say uh, that uh, greenish yellow thousands of gallons is removed off site, where specifically does that go? Okay, 
Uh, so the waste is um, currently being disposed at um, Michigan Disposal Waste Treatment Plant in Belleville, Michigan. So um, with the PFAS and with the, the heavy metals that were present, um, which is considered characteristically hazardous waste, that material has to be stabilized and solidified. Um, so it's, it's handled at that facility. Okay. And uh, somebody asked, so when I was in law school, I was told there'd be no math. I didn't ask about complex carbon names and sort of molecules and stuff, but uh, chromium-6 is identified. Uh, that's being treated the same way? Is that, is that how that, that's taken care of? Solidified, I think was the way you put it? So part of my other job is that I oversee uh, the waste management program in Southeast Michigan, and we regulate hazardous waste treatment, storage, and disposal facilities. So like the facility that EPA is sending this material to, uh, we license and inspect and, and oversee the, the, the operation of those facilities. What you essentially have to do is match the kind of waste with the sort of treatment technology that a treatment facility has. Um, and so because we have this sort of complex combination of industrial wastes and PFAS, there's only certain treatment technologies that can take care of that. And so what happens to it at Michigan Disposal is it goes and it gets mixed with cement kiln dust in a, in a big pit, and then it goes into a hazardous waste landfill. Um, and so s mixing with the cement kiln dust essentially uh, stabilizes or, or uh, stops any of that, those contaminants from being able to leach or mobilize out of out of that uh, solidified, you know, you're turning, taking a liquid and putting it in with, with this solid material, and you're solidifying it and putting it on a landfill. Okay. Property values. Anybody have experience with an a, a incident like this and the impact on uh, nearby or maybe not so nearby property values? Anybody? I have this in Madison Heights, so from my standpoint, I don't, I wouldn't think that there would be, but I. So property values, I wouldn't think that this would have any effect on that. Um, we haven't had this before in Madison Heights, so I don't have any past history to look at. We have talked to Oakland County Equalization and they don't seem to think that it does. There aren't any residential homes in the area. And you know, we've gotten a lot of bad press out of this, but as Tracy explained, really the um, negative effects are not that great. So. so that sounds like one that maybe we'll learn a little more about over time. Um, it, it, are either agents, well, the state of the Fed, uh, I'm uh, going to be tracking the incidence of cancer, if any, uh, as a result of this incident in the area. Is that a, a normal thing to do or even? Sure, I'll, I'll take that. So um, there is, there is something called a national cancer registry and a state cancer registry. It, every incidence of cancer throughout the state is reported to that registry. Now that sounds very good, and it is. However, to the question of, is there going to be, or can there be an ability to evaluate that data, say around this site, and determine something like relationships between the contamination found on that property and cancer rates? The answer is, there's really no not from that data set, and here's why. Because that, that data set only records the person's address at the time their cancer was diagnosed, right? So they could live in California for 50 years, moved to Madison Heights for two days, been diagnosed with cancer, and that gets recorded in our registry. Or somebody could live for 50 years in Madison Heights, moved to California, gotten cancer, and it gets reported out in California. And so the registry doesn't have any information about occupational work or your um, you know, past, you know, just personal history, genetics, any of that information. So uh, it, there is not really a way to do that work. Now the second, the second thing to keep in mind, however, it goes all the way back to what Tracy said at the very, very beginning, which is for these hazardous substances, and two of them are known carcinogens, for them to cause harm, for the chemicals from this property to cause harm, for that harm to occur, they have to actually get to people, right? So if they don't get to someone, then they cannot cause that harm. How are we gonna figure that out? It goes back to work that Tracy 
and Trish are doing uh, by looking at the soil and groundwater and figuring out how has it left the property. And they're not done yet, but at this point, as Tracy and Trish explained, it looks to be localized on the property. I'll stop there. All right, thank you. Uh, I, one of the questions in the stack here somewhere, uh, is there, and if there is, how much of any of this contaminant is ending up in our beautiful Lake St. Clair or other uh, parts of our <coughs> lakes? Sure, so I can try to address that, Mike. Um, you know, we're not certain how long this was happening before it was observed on December 20th. I think we've all seen uh, the aerial photos that were run that show over the years, you can go into Google Earth and you can slide back in time and you can see that weed coming out of the side of the wall. There's really no way to know if that was contaminated water or not, or if that's just a, a spot in the wall where the, the water se tends to seep out. But I don't think it's unreasonable to conclude that you know, this business has been operating there for a long time. And he was using that pit to store hazardous chemicals for a long time. Now, when he was operating, he was pumping that water into the sanitary sewer. Um, he, he told us that he, it was like a sump pump, right? He, he used it uh, to keep his basement from flooding. Um, so we don't really know how long it was happening before December 20th. Um, but we can make some reasonable estimations about December 20th forward based on the amount of liquid that we, you know, we observe seeping out, how much water Trisha's teams are recovering. Um, you know, and these were, the, these were the estimations that our engineers used to, to do this uh, modeling as to whether or not it would be having an impact on Lake St. Clair. So we think that very small volumes were seeping onto the shoulder. I mean, certainly there's a lot of contaminated groundwater sort of backed up between the facility and the embankment. But what was seeping out was probably, you know, in the hundred, hundreds of gallons a day. You know, not thousands, not tens of thousands of gallons. And so you had a small volume of water seeping onto the shoulder, um, carrying, you know, contaminants with it for sure. Um, and then mixing with all of that water that comes down 696, and all that water that, you know, the Clinton River has a large watershed. So by the time you would measure it in Lake St. Clair, you wouldn't be able to find it. Um, but certainly, you know, it's still there in very small concentrations. I have an in-ground garden. I do have an in-ground garden. Should I be concerned if I live in this vicinity? I'll take the first, first stab at it, and then Tracy can chime in. She has additional information. So at this point, again, it starts with the question, if you're looking at the contamination from this property, this, this, this site, and how far has it moved, it appears that what we have is uh, regional soil contamination and shallow groundwater contamination. They're still, they're still tracking, so you know, there's still more to be learned, but at this point, it does not appear that we're going to uh, reach to a point where um, we would expect that to get into uh, the neighborhoods to the south. Having said that, having said that, there's a little public health information I feel I should share, which is if you are gardening in any urban city, anywhere in the United States, anywhere, right? Urban cities have uh, lead in the soil. Why? It used to be in the gasoline. If you live along a highway where there's lots of traffic and it's been there a really long time, you may find there's lead in your soil. So, there's some very practical advice about gardening. If you want to, you like to garden, sometimes what you could do is do raised beds, meaning you create a raised bed, put in clean soil, raise your, raise your garden that way. Happy to talk more about that at another time. Anything else, Tracy, you want to add? No, I think that's fair for me. Okay. And if I want to do so, how would I go about having my soil and my garden tested? Oh, excellent question. Okay, I thought so. I have a number. And we can uh, get this put up. So, um, so you can get soil testing done with uh, Michigan State University Diagnostic Center for Population and Animal Health. Uh, they will do soil testing. Uh, this is a couple of years old, 2014. Uh, but uh, if you have a pencil, here it is: 517-353-2000. And we can get that. 517-353-1683, and they'll do, uh, you know, do uh, soil testing. There's another one on here as well, so there's a couple of options. Um, as well as, if you want to talk to somebody first before you do that, what you want to look for, 
be happy to talk, uh, you can contact with one of our toxicologists. We have some good information to share with you. And I think the EPA wants to. So we would also, um, EPA, we've done some events in the past in other um, urban communities where we will do um, soil testing. So like for a day and the residents can bring, um, bring samples from their garden and we can screen them for heavy metals. Um, not that we believe that it's obviously related to this site, but we would like to do that as a community outreach. Hopefully we can schedule that maybe this sometime this summer. Okay. So I, so that that address was at Michigan State, right? What's that? That address was at Michigan State? Oh. Not, not that other school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I that's how we Michigan State University. Yeah, the University of you. Michigan may have something to they just, you know. No, you know, I'm not biased, I just asked. <laughs> um, so, uh, the employees, I don't know if we have an employee in the room, but somebody was asking about the employees at the facility that uh, leaked all this stuff. Uh, have they been followed up on? Do we know what's the health risk to them? Um, so I'll, I'll take, I can take part of the question. So the, the, the question you wanted to It's a good thing you're here today. What's that? It's a good thing you're here today. I can do part of it. There's another part that I cannot do. So, so uh, in public health, what I deal with is the non-occupational stuff, you know, residents. It's where you live and play. That's, that's my job and my colleagues. There's another uh, entity called MIOSHA, Michigan Occupational uh, Safety Health Administration. And those are the folks who do the regulatory oversight of workplace uh, chemical exposures. Um, and so I, I try not to speak for them, uh, but we can get, you know, we can one get their phone number and, and get that information. Now, I'll give you, there are a couple parts we can help with. Number one, again, happy to connect you with one of our toxicologists to talk through some of these chemicals. If you're a worker, so you know what I said before, if, if the chemical doesn't get to you, it can't harm you. If you're in a work environment where you're not, where you don't have all the personal protective equipment that maybe you should have had, then you probably were in contact with it. Then it becomes a much more difficult question to answer. And so we can do two things. One, happy to have our toxicologist talk with you about chromium or cyanide and, and what are the short-term, long-term uh, concerns. And two, if you are working with your doctor on a health concern, and they want to get connected to an expert in occupational and environmental medicine. Uh, there are a couple of entities, uh, websites you can go to. Again, have, one of them is called the um, AOEC, Association of Occupational and Environmental Clinicians. Secondly, there's uh, another group called Michigan's Occupational and Environmental Medicine Association, MOMA, M O. EMA. Both of those can get you doctors who are experts in looking at the clinical effects in relation to occupational exposure. So on those last two parts, happy to talk with folks. If you're wondering about the regulatory or what kind of follow-up happens with workers, that is clearly my OSHA's uh, uh, area that's outside of what I can help you with in public health. Anybody else? No? Okay. Um, if I had days, I could organize these into cross-exam type questions and there'd just be a yes or a no. And we don't have that time, so I'm, we're doing the best we can. Um, what, what, given where we are today on this incident, uh, and this gets into some of the legislation, which I know is very, in, in very infant stage, anybody have any thoughts about legislation that would be helpful? Uh, to improve, uh, for instance, this situation lingering for some number of years before it was addressed? Yeah, sure, so I can take that question. Um, like I mentioned, the governor has asked EGLE to do a review of our processes to see what improvements can be done with the policies and the resources that we currently have. And I, I do think that there are some things that can be changed. Um, I think that there are uh, different ways we can select facilities for inspection, different kinds of inspections that we can do, and, and try to move toward a more risk-based process. Um, so I think you can look forward to getting seeing some recommendations for the agency. Certainly, I don't think anyone on this panel is prepared to speak for you know legislative or policy suggestions at this time. I mean, your elected officials are here. I think they're happy to hear your ideas. Um, but I think for today, we should probably uh, put the policy discussion aside. Yeah, I mean, we know legislation is in the works. Um, 
I, I, so my basement flooded this past year. Um, should I be concerned about the water that back up into my basement in light of this incident? So like we showed uh, with some of the maps that we put up, we, you know, all the information we have shows that the contamination is localized right around the building. We have no reason to believe that contaminated groundwater has moved into the neighborhoods. You know, like Corey said, for these contaminants to get to you, they have to move to you, right? So the contamination started at this building. You have to think about how would it get into your yard or how would it get into your home? And it's gonna move there subsurface, you know, with water, right? So that's why EPA is sampling the groundwater. So, you know, we haven't fully, you know, outlined the, the exact extent and border of this contamination plume, but the information we have so far shows that it's really localized around this building and on the embankment of the expressway. So, I don't think that there's any concern for this site impacting anything that may have backed up into your basement. And certainly, um, with any, uh, any basement backup, you know, it could be carrying anything that is in the sanitary sewer. And so businesses in your community do discharge industrial wastes into sanitary sewers. Um, but I, I tell you that your biggest concern with basement backup is a bacteriological hazard. Okay, so it's a communicable disease, it's a bacteriological hazard. If you have a basement backup is, is your main concern. Okay, uh, so I, I was just handed another stack of questions. Folks got right as cramps. Um, so we're going to try and get one sentence answers if we can. I want you to be informative, but we can always follow up. At, you know, this thing's being live streamed and, and recorded, and then there will be the follow-up website. So we'll get back to these questions if they're needed. But, all right. So this is a fairly popular question. I'm trying to try and keep it apolitical. We'll see how that goes. So um, in light of our national um, uh, approach to, to things. Um, <laughs> there, well, yeah, just let me know. There were some tax cuts, and we now seem to be paying those with service cuts. What, if any, uh, impact have either of uh, our EPA or, uh, or Eagle seen in uh, their budget impacting their ability to respond to this incident uh, or other incidents like it? <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you. You're civil servants. Okay. I, mean, I, I guess the one thing I would I would point out, and, and you're right. I, I mean, I'm not in a position to speak to our, our budgets and our resources and whatnot. But um, you know, th this situation grew over time. This is not this is not something that happened, you know, since this administration or because of the last administration. I mean, there has been uh, sort of you know across the board. Uh, some challenges associated with addressing a facility like this. And, and when we get into this evaluation, we may find that there are policy gaps, we may find that there are funding gaps or resource gaps, um, but I, I don't think that it's it's fair at this time to sort of correlate a, a current political situation with, with what we're seeing on the ground in Madison Heights. So earlier, um, I think the, the panel took a pass on how much it's cost to date. I didn't ask how much it's gonna cost to the end. Um, I assume the answer is the same, but we just don't know yet. But um, it, it, do we have any sense of uh, whether there's enough money to take care of cleaning this up? Or does the city of Madison no, Heights get enough money? Or how does it work? There's not enough money. There's not enough money. So like I mentioned, you know, there are 9,000 contaminated properties in Southeast Michigan, okay? Uh, we are currently working on state funded cleanups at 60 of them, okay? There's not enough money for the state to clean up these sites, okay? So we're overseeing about 700 cleanups on uh, sites where the, the responsible party is doing the cleanup. Um, but, you know, we work on, I, Paul helped me, at $15 million a year statewide for state-funded cleanups. Um, you know, this cleanup will be not in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. This will be in the low, you know, million dollar, millions of dollars range. Uh, there's not enough money to clean these all up. Uh, is it, uh, folks, we gotta stick, I, I hear some mumbling, but I can't hear whatever is being said. Um, so guys, stick to these, ask for a cart. If you've got a follow up, ask for a cart. Um, is, is the Superfund implicated here in any fashion? 
So I talked about the Superfund preliminary assessment that we did. Superfund is the federal program. We've got some folks here, so please chime in when I start uh, getting this wrong. But Superfund is the uh, federal program that addresses our most contaminated sites, and it's the responsibility of the state. Our, we have a program that EPA gives us grant funding for where we evaluate our sites and rank them to see if they meet that threshold. This site did not meet that threshold because those pathways we talked about were not completed, right? We don't have an impact to drinking water. We don't have a you know significant migration to surface water, so this does not meet that threshold of being one of the you know sort of worst of the worst contaminated properties. Right. So ba based on everything I've seen sitting here and the questions, we get a bunch of these same questions. Uh, there was some notice or some knowledge, it appears, back in 2016. Why weren't we doing what we're doing now at the site back in 2016? Yes, sure. So, um, as I mentioned, the, when we came in and we noticed, uh, we observed these conditions that posed an imminent and substantial public health threat to the community. That's why we shut the business down and immediately referred it to EPA to come in and update the immediate hazard. Um, it was, we did know there was soil and groundwater contamination under that building. Um, but just, you know, we did not have to go through the formal CERCLA process for environmental professionals associated with this area to know that it was not threatening anybody's ground, you know, threatening anybody's drinking water. And so at that point, we start the process to go through that Superfund assessment. Um, you know, the folks that do that assessment is here, so if anybody has any questions, you know, Joan, keep them in the front row, they can talk to you about that Superfund assessment process. Um, but like I said, at that point, it sort of joins the ranks of the 9,000 contaminated sites in Southeast Michigan that uh, about 20 some remediation staff are managing. And so it didn't reach that threshold of being a Superfund site. Now I will say they are completing a reassessment because that first assessment was based on a lot of worst case scenario assumptions because we didn't have a lot of data that sort of a desktop evaluation. Now that EPA has collected all of this data, they are going to do a reassessment um, but you know the realities are the same in terms of pathway, right? That everyone is still on municipal water. We don't have a, an impact to people's drinking water. So I would not, uh, I would not, you know, assume that a reassessment is going to get this site on the Superfund list. Thank you. So there are a number of questions about the owner of the site without naming his name. Um, his name is Gary Sayers, and he's responsible for the pollution of the site. <laughs> Probably a state of unity. I'm not sure I do. Um, He's in federal prison. So, uh, with respect to uh, that person, what's going to happen to him when he gets out of prison? This is a several part question. Uh, will does he have any more money or assets to go after? Are they being gone after? And then there was a suggestion he owns some property up in Petoskey worth a few a few dollars. So the state has looked at the other properties that Mr. Sayers is associated with. I understand the property in Petoskey is his sister's property. We did have staff go by there uh, to see if there was any, you know, sort of concern. It appeared to be a rather nice lake house. It did not appear to be a chemical hoarding situation. Um, you've seen on the news the site up in Santa Light County or near Deckerville. Um, we're doing some investigation on that property. Um, it does appear to be, you know, a lot of junk. Um, it does not appear that there's an obvious chemical hazard on that property. Um, he also has a property down in Commonwealth Street in Detroit. Um, it was again sort of another hoarding situation, but this time mostly with stuff, right, and not, not, not necessarily chemicals. We did find pits in that building that were filled with liquids. Um, we had them tested. They were not hazardous waste, but they still had some concentrations, low levels of metals and a little bit of PFAS. So we're pumping that out and taking it to an appropriate disposal facility. Um, Gary Sayer still owns those properties. Um, he did plead guilty, and he entered a guilty plea. It does have some conditions in it though that you know uh, this plea agreement as to what he can be held responsible for for past um, enforcement, or past violations I should say. Um, but the Attorney General's office has said that they're reviewing all of this and trying to identify any other potential enforcement avenues we may have with this violator. Thank you. Uh, Bear Creek, several questions about Bear Creek. What's the status of Bear Creek testing contamination found or not found? Sure, so we sampled Bear Creek, like I mentioned. Bear Creek is the, the smallest and most nearby waterway, so we really thought if we were going to find contamination from this site, we would find it there. Um, we see it's about three miles away where it opens up. 
We sampled there for chromium, TCE, and cyanide. All of those industrial chemicals were below our water quality standards. Um, we did find some PFAS just above the water quality standard. We're continuing to sample that um, you know, on an on a every couple week basis here um, because you know, water samples can be variable with rainwater and, and flow and that sort of thing. So we're gonna continue to sample that to, to, see, uh, to see if there's any change there. But at this time, we're not seeing a water quality impact in Bear Creek because of this site. Are all the samplings that are being done in relation to this incident available or will they be available with all, with all the related data on a website somewhere? Yes, uh, so there's a, there's a web viewer um, through the EPA's website. Um, if, you, if you search EPA electroplating services, um, you should be able to find the link to that. And so that website is regularly updated. And at the bottom of the page, if you scroll down, um, there's a, a highlighted and it says interactive viewer and so you can actually uh, toggle and choose which samples if you want a groundwater sample if you want soil samples and it'll actually um, highlight those samples by color there's a legend gives you some explanations of you know what they're compared against and you can see the analytical results uh, there as well and we will continue to update it it's a lot of um, data there's hundreds of samples pulled. Uh, so we're trying to continue to keep that updated uh, regularly. Okay. Where would these folks go to, fit, to understand precisely uh, what is meant by uh, contaminants uh, below levels of concern or uh, not exceeding drinking water criteria? Where would you send them to try to understand what those things mean? Yeah, so um, unfortunately it's not an easy answer. There's a lot of different environmental criteria that we use to evaluate a site like this. And so when I say that your drinking water was sampled and it meets criteria, that's the criteria of the Safe Drinking Water Act. And so we make sure that water systems that provide public water sample their water and make sure it, it meets what we call drinking water standards. But when we're looking at a site of contamination and you're sampling the groundwater, you're comparing that, or the soil, you're comparing it to different criteria. And unfortunately, there's not one easy number. I mean, I have a difficult time with this chart, right? But, you know, there's, there's gonna be one column for groundwater that's used for drinking water. Well, this groundwater's not used for that. There's gonna be a column for groundwater uh, to consider vapor intrusion hazard. Um, and in fact, we don't even use the number on the column because we develop site-specific criteria based on the size of the building and the depth of groundwater and that sort of thing. So it is not an easy task even for environmental professionals and environmental consultants to, to navigate what is the appropriate criteria to compare a number to. You really have to put it in context of what it is you're trying to evaluate. So, you know, there's soil numbers, for, you know, if someone's gonna come in direct contact with it. So, um, you know, I think EPA is putting together this web viewer and they are putting it in context. They are selecting the appropriate criteria. Um, I understand folks may wanna do some of that research on your own because Believe me, I understand when I say things are below criteria, you say, yeah, well, what about that criteria? And I, I get that, right? But know that, you know, this isn't just EPA. They have hired, you know, consultants and engineering firms and their labs. These are all independent, you know, multiple organizations involved in validating this data. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a complicated answer. And if anyone's really super interested in digging into this, I'll give you my number and we can spend an hour on the phone tomorrow and I'll walk you through it. And I think another thing to note is, so we are trying um, on that web viewer, which I just made a note of something else to add, but we're trying to put definitions to that as well um, to explain the criteria that we're, that we're comparing it against. So um, we'll, uh, we'll continue to update that as well. So I know that. And we're, we're looking to um, get permission so that we want to have, um, be able to be, uh, house all of the analytical, so the drinking water, that Madison Heights, um, their analytical that they received, we're looking to put all of that on our web viewer so that you only have like one stop shopping so you can re review all of that analytical on one place. So there's gonna be a little bit of lag before we get all of that, but we're heading there. And, and so our intention is to do so. So the numbers will be there and they can dig them out. Um, all right, so before we go to the next question, I have probably 15 in my hand and another 50 in front of me. We talked about a hard stop at eight o'clock. 
Um, if folks want to stay past, I've been asked to keep this moving and continue for at least a little while. Um, so feel free to, you know, we've been here two hours. If you want to exit the room, feel free. You're not going to interrupt anybody. But we're going to try and go a little longer. I don't know what that means. I suppose some will give me a hook. All right, uh, air quality testing. I think there was a discussion, I was reading questions and you were talking and I kind of heard that there was air quality testing in the plant. It, has there been subsequent air quality testing? Will it continue? And what about around the plant in the vicinity? So uh, we conducted air, so there was air quality testing the, the night that we let, let, Well, why don't we take a moment? We'll give everybody a minute to, if you want to go home and you actually have something else to do. Um, Feel free. Hi, this is Kathleen Long and I'm no one has a possible plan. We are going to resume just then. Uh, so for all of you that are filing out, I can talk loud. Uh, thank you again for coming tonight. I really appreciate all the time you took to come and be educated about this. Uh, I appreciate your openness to hearing, hearing the information. And please feel free to reach out uh, either through your elected officials or directly through any of the numbers that were provided to get in touch with us and ask more questions. Okay, Mike, do you want to keep going? You want to keep going? Let's keep going. All There's right, still people here. Let's keep going. You have you got to get home tonight? No, these people need to get home. Okay. All right. We're used to it. So we're talking about the air quality? Air quality. All right. All right. Next. So the, uh, the evening that we mobilized to the site, Oakland County uh, Hazmat team assisted with air quality uh, readings. Um, since that time, we have done air quality reading um, down breathing zone of uh, where we maintain our frack tank and there's daily air monitoring done um, around the frack tank uh, to ensure that we don't have any elevated readings and we haven't had any any readings of any concern with the maybe we could close that door is that possible all right uh, so the, one of the overwhelming questions is how do we prevent this from happening again? Uh, regulation, legislation, more money for staff to go around and do inspections. What, what do we need to do to prevent this from happening in my hometown? Yeah, so um, I think I've tried to touch on this a couple of times, right? The department and the, uh, at the insistence of the governor is conducting a review of our pollution inspection procedures. We're going to be looking at our programs and figuring out you know, what can we do with the resources we have to better select uh, on a risk-based process facilities for inspection, okay? Um, what I didn't get into, I don't know if you guys can remember way back to when I said I'm gonna skip this slide. I had a list of the different kinds of environmental regulations that a site like Electric Plating Services is subject to and they're subject to Clean Air Act requirements, Clean Water Act requirements, hazardous waste requirements. But because they're actually a fairly small operation, they're not, um, they're not real, you know, they're not visited on a, a very frequent basis. I and mean, I'm talking like once every five years, once every 10 years for certain kinds of programs. Because we inspect sites like landfills and wastewater treatment plants where the risk is larger. We inspect those much more frequently. And so through this review process that the governor's asked for, we're gonna be looking at, you know, what can we do better, uh, maybe with some better technology to better identify risks. Because I'm going to tell you guys, it's hard to keep track of 9,000 sites. And so when I run some spreadsheets and I go through, you know, how many how many have been inspected, it's sort of a numbers game, and it's 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 you know unfortunately too easy for for one to fall in the cracks if you know you have a couple of key retirements and 
someone forgets about that weird place down the road, okay? So I think there's some things we can do with technology and there's some things we can do with these process improvements. I am not going to go into you know, policy improvements and the bills that have been introduced and that sort of thing in this forum. So when my kids ask for my food, oh, so I'm sorry. I just wanted to follow that up. That was the state perspective. I kind of wanted to add from the city of Madison Heights. So in, in 2016, fire chief went out and they were inspecting. There's 18 sites. There's actually 23 businesses in Madison Heights, but some of those are separate businesses. And they were inspecting those on a biannual basis. So our fire department has changed that to an annual basis, and they actually have increased it for high hazard sites. So those 18 sites or 23 are known as Title III sites um, through the Superfund list, I think. So they've added all um, other high hazard sites in the city. So that would include places as simple as Home Depot that carries fertilizer. So that is happening on an annual, a rolling annual basis through our fire department with our fire marshal currently. And uh, on that score, yeah. has the city incurred a greater cost? Do you have any sense of what that might be? Well, we haven't hired anybody to do that, but the fire marshal is spending time on that, so it's something else he's not able to spend time on. So there was a cost, but it's at no additional taxpayer cost because we haven't hired extra help to do that. So the fire marshal was here, but I think he stepped out for a minute. Just don't take it out of the legal fund, that's all I ask. <laughs> um, uh, how will wildlife, fishery, and so on be affected now and in the future? from any of this, I suppose that goes to Bear Creek. Yeah, I think that gets into our water quality standards. And so I said, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of criteria we use when we're evaluating environmental data. When we look at drinking water criteria, right, that's for your ingestion, that's for your health. But when I say water quality criteria, that's protective of aquatic life as well. And so that is intended to account for bioaccumulation, it's intended to account for toxicity to aquatic organisms. So when I say that we've sampled Bear Creek and it's below our water quality standards, it's below the levels that are protective of those organisms. Now I did mention that uh, PFAS was just above water quality standards, and we do know, you know, like I said, Bear Creek goes into the Clinton River, into the lake. Um, we do have PFAS in Lake St. Clair above water quality standards to the degree that we have uh, a fish consumption advisory for PFAS. And so if you're a fisherman, or fisherwoman and you eat uh, the fish that you catch on a Lake St. Clair or the Lower Clinton River, please go to eatsafefish.com slash eatsafefish. And it explains, you know, the fish consumption advisories. Most of those are for mercury, PCBs, dioxin. But um, we do have some new fish consumption advisories on Lake St. Clair for PFAS, not because of this site, but because of a source of PFAS we have right where the Clinton River joins Lake St. Clair. Um, we have a, a more significant source of PFAS down in that area. I'm sure that your answer is going to be similar to the governor's reviewing everything, uh, but uh, there's some questions, several questions about will we be seeing an increased tax or a new tax as a result of any or all of this uh, cleanup in particular? Yeah, so Mike, I can't speak to any uh, policy or funding questions. Uh, I don't know if maybe elected officials maybe want to sidebar on that sort of thing later, but. Um, maybe we could skip to just the technical yeah. questions. No, I understand. Yeah. We'll get to that. We'll try and answer that. Um, can the city revoke a business license if any violations come up at, uh, on these state or federal laws? Well, actually this business, not every business in the city of Madison Heights is required to have a business license. So this particular business is not as licensed for other things through the state. Um, so there was no mechanism for the city to revoke a business license. They don't do a business license renewal, and that's included in the city charter. The businesses that need to get them and, and don't. Thank you. Has any testing been taken near Lincoln Avenue? Is Lincoln on the north side of 636? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I wish I still had my picture. Do you guys remember my picture? Uh, okay, with the green, right? So I said we have about 10 feet of sandy soils, right, on top of a 100, 140 foot deep clay layer, okay? So picture before 696 was constructed, that same geology goes all the way across, right? Uh, it's sort of regional geology, it has to do with glaciers and uh, glaciers. Um, but that, that clay goes all the way across, and they cut 696 like a big trench in the middle. 
So the, the expressway is essentially cutting off that contamination. It does not have any way to migrate to the north side of the highway. Uh, if the contamination gets under 696, so maybe you think, well, maybe it's seeping behind that wall and can get under the road. It's going to get into the drainage for the highway and move into that storm sewer system. Even if it were to fill the whole area under the road and move, keep moving north, then it has to get up an 18-foot clay hill before it can get into the neighborhood on the north side of the highway, which just defies the laws of physics. So the, you know, the, uh, the highway is essentially just cutting off the migration here. And I mean, we've heard some of the speakers say, like, thank goodness the highway was there, right? It cut it off, and it allowed us to see this problem. But we've, uh, there's just there's it's not migrating to the north, so there's been no sampling in the community to the north of the highway. So we talked about uh, some of the uh, travails of inspecting and keeping tabs on an existing business in a, in a closed building. Uh, do either of your agencies require those who are delivering uh, toxic chemicals or contaminated type chemicals? Uh, are they required to be licensed separately? And are they tracked perhaps more closely? So the transportation of hazardous waste is regulated. Um, the transportation of hazardous chemicals uh, you know, has DOT regulations, right, for placarding and making sure it's safe on the roads. Um, but there's not any sort of requirement, you know, on behalf of the manufacturer or the shipper to keep track of what's happening, um, you know, at an industrial facility that's buying their chemicals. All right, so we've gone over. We have at least as many questions as I've already asked. Uh, what, what do folks want to do? Keep going. I mean, I don't know. Do we have facility constraints? I mean, at least go till 8.30 and we'll see where we are. Yeah. Okay, let's, yeah, let's reassess at 8.30. All right. Of course, I haven't reviewed these either, so. <laughs> You're going to have to bear with me. Um, So um, when we talk about what happens to the toxic chemical or the, the liquid chemical, it, it's solidified, I think was the, the term. Does that remain toxic forever and is that stored in a hazardous waste dump or? So that's the intention of solidification. Like I said, you know, in hazardous waste management, you match the waste stream with the treatment technology. So depending on what is in the waste you're trying to get rid of, maybe you solidify it. Maybe you put it through a, an industrial wastewater treatment plant and discharge it to the sanitary sewer. It really depends. And so, you know, when Trisha said, you know, she puts it into the tank and tests it to find out what she's working with, a lot of that is for, for disposal purposes, to figure out who has the right mix of treatment technology to deal with it. So when you solidify it with cement kiln dust, it immobilizes those contaminants so that they don't continue to leach out. And then it goes into a, a hazardous waste landfill, which is the most highly, you know, regulated type of landfill we have. We have one commercial hazardous waste landfill in the state. It's in Belleville. It's right next to the treatment plant that this is going to. It's lined. The leachate's managed. It's monitored. It's got a restrictive covenant on it. Um, but it's sequestered, essentially, right? We're taking something out of a community in a place we don't want it. We're putting it in a place, you know, for all of time where it can be sequestered and isolated for people. It's out. I'm not sure that this, I'm not sure how this question relates, but on the possibility that it does to the city, how many water main breaks have happened in Madison Heights, Hazel Park in the last 20 years? I have no idea. Thank you. I don't know that um, answer. How many years will this site be monitored by any state, fed, whoever? We, like we mentioned, we don't have the long-term remedy yet, and so we don't know what the monitoring scheme might be. I mean, at this point, EPA is putting a Band-Aid on the problem, right? They're pumping the water to abate the imminent problem while, you know, EPA and the state work with the city and the county to figure out what the long-term solution is. So it will really depend on what that long-term solution is, what the monitoring will be. So uh, to display my total ignorance on the subject, if you dug up the ground from underneath the the plant right out there to the freeway. 
would you would that be one way of getting rid of the problem because that's where all the contaminant is sitting? Yeah, so that's what we call source removal, right? So the source of the contamination is underneath the building. Um, I think someone mentioned earlier that you can't get to the source until the building comes down. Um, you know, usually environmental remediation is a multi-part solution. You do some source removal, maybe you can't get all of it, um, but even if you get all this, the source removal, you have impact off-site, so a lot of times you I mean, Trisha built this great uh, but temporary interceptor trench, but often we put in some sort of what we call pump and treat or pump and haul system, some way where we are inter, um, intercepting the groundwater in its place. So it'll probably be a multi-part solution, um, but to get to that source removal, the building would have to come down. This sounds like perhaps a suggestion for future legislation, but um, are there currently requirements for any industry members who use hazardous chemicals to acquire life, uh, insurance such that whatever they cause can be covered. So hazardous waste management is uh, probably the most complex set of environmental regs we have. I think the air people might argue with me, but the waste regs are pretty tough. Uh, it, it's sort of a tiered system. So the places that take hazardous waste in and either treat it, store it, or dispose of it, like that landfill or that solidification plant we were talking about, those places are licensed by EGLE. Um, they require financial assurance, and there's all sorts of regulatory oversight there. The companies that are in the business of picking up hazardous waste and moving it around, we call those transporters, they require uh, a special kind of pollution insurance. The 9,000 businesses in Southeast Michigan that generate hazardous waste, and the, I think there's 22,000 of them statewide, you can generate hazardous waste. You can be a dry cleaner, a, parts in a manufacturing facility, you can generate hazardous waste. There's no uh, pollution insurance requirement. There's no licensing requirement. Um, you have a set of rules you're supposed to follow, and we come in on a certain frequency, once every five years, five to seven years, and sort of spot check that you're following those rules. You're supposed to keep track of the waste you, you generate. You're supposed to ship it off site appropriately. You're supposed to follow all of these rules but you are not required to have any specific financial assurance or uh, pollution insurance liability. Pollution liability insurance. Not to put you on the spot, but. Keep going, Mike. What's Eagle's budget these days? You put me on the spot. I don't know what Eagle's yeah. budgets are. I am safely in middle management where I'm not in charge of budgets. Other than not enough. Sure. Um, we're the one A couple of, well, probably more than that. Um, Again, so folks are sitting at home, drinking their water, growing their plants in the garden, eating fish out of the river. Is there any way to quantify the risk that we are all encountering with those sites that we just don't know about yet? Hey, I don't make this stuff. Yeah, up. That's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, and I might look to Corey a little bit to help. But um, I, I guess I would probably you know, we have about 9,000 contaminated sites in Michigan, and we they're not fully characterized. We don't know everything about all of them, so we have not fully identified all the hazards associated with all those facilities. There's an environmental mapper online. If you go to michigan.gov slash eagle, go to land, go to the land cleanup tab, you can find this environmental mapper. It will show you the sites in your community that we know are contaminated. I think uh, a couple of things, right? And Corey, you can uh, jump in if I start going too far down your road. Most everybody in this room, especially if, you know, unless you came in from elsewhere in the communities, outside, outside communities, when you're on public water, when you, have, you know, when you have city water, the entity that provides your water, for most of us that's Great Lakes Water Authority, they are sampling that water all the time to make sure that it meets the Safe Drinking Water Act. And they send you a report every year called a Consumer Confidence Report. You get that in July, and it's also on your city's website. So you can look to see that your drinking water is meeting safe drinking water standards and that you're pro being provided with safe and clean drinking water. Um, you know, some of these concerns we have, like I mentioned with vapor intrusion, um, you know, unless, if we are aware of a contaminated property and we're aware that the groundwater is contaminated, and we think there's a vapor intrusion risk, we're gonna work with our local health departments so and we're gonna contact you as a homeowner. But if we are not aware of that contamination, uh, we don't know to knock on your door. 
And so I think there, there, is, there are some unknowns out there. And just like with PFAS, right? PFAS was an unknown five years ago, right? And now we're finding that it's affected drinking water systems, you know, in, in private wells in some parts of the state. So I think there's always a risk of an unknown, and maybe the health guy can tell us more about how to manage the anxiety that comes with these unknowns. How to manage the anxiety? <laughs> Um, I thought Tracy covered pretty well. A couple, couple of thoughts there. One, very true. If you're under, if you're on a private well, then you are your own water quality expert. So, you know, that's why municipal water is so nice. Is you have people who are monitoring. It. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Secondly, Eagle does have uh, air uh, air monitoring, and you can go to a website, um, Air Quality Index, that covers uh, some of the. National Ambient Air Quality pollutants. So it gives you some uh, measure of air contamination. Broadly, it does not cover a broad set of chemicals. Uh, thirdly, there are fish advisories and some wild game advisories. So we do some testing in collaboration with our partners at Eagle at the Health Department um, to look at what's in them, uh, what's in those uh, you know, fish and deer. So if you're out hunting and fishing, we talked about gardening, if you're in an urban environment, um, so that's, a, that's sort of your broad general topics. Indoor air tends to be uh, more contaminated than outdoor air, and it's a combination of some of what you do in your own house. So, you know, if, if you start looking things up, if you have your own fireplace and you're burning wood and you don't have good ventilation, you're causing air pollution in your house. Even though you don't smoke, you're smoking the wood. Uh, so you can do a lot of things in your own house, depending on what you're doing, that you can lower your air quality. So the, you know, it's a mix. And then there are all the situations, the 9,000 sites, the 30,000 sites statewide, where there's still a lot of work to be done to figure out if industrial hazardous waste has gotten in the groundwater and is vaporizing in people's homes or is in their private wells. So, and we do it case by case. We have toxicologists and epidemiologists and we think there's exposure. My last thought is we think there is exposure and to the question of cancer or other disease. We then go forward with, um, you know, collecting more data all the way to something called a health study. Pretty rare, but we have one now for PFAS. So there are ways to look into it. There's a statistician out there somewhere trying to figure out the, how do we quantify what we don't know, um, and he'll probably come up with an answer. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, this question really goes. We know the much broader issues, but. Is there any aspect of this uh, incident uh, related to the closure of Macomb County beaches? Um, the Macomb County beaches is primarily a bacteriological problem, right? So it's not related to this thing. Yeah. Uh, the watersheds and aquifers in Michigan, um, are they tested generically? I mean, as it sits underneath our state, uh, unrelated to any particular site, but is that body of ultimate drinking water, is that tested routinely or randomly or what? So our water resources division at Eagle does um, a lot of surface water assessment. They go around the state and they sample our surface water bodies with a lot of regularity. And I'm gonna point out somebody in the second row here, Melinda Stempfler. Um, if you have questions, and I apologize, I'm not super up on where you can find that data, but I do believe they post it. So if you wanna get with Melinda, she can probably point out to you where you can find that information. So where would you look for that information? You would go and you would talk to Melinda Steffler. <laughs> that young lady right there. Don't let her leave. Or you would, could probably Google Michigan surface water assessment section. Um, you know, like I said, they go around the state, they do ambient water quality sampling. We do a lot of sampling of pollution sources, right? So wastewater treatment plants and steel mills and anybody with a discharge permit, we're sampling what they're putting out into the environment. They sample that stuff all the time. We sample it on a different frequency. But these guys, these biologists go out and they just sample our lakes and rivers, not associated with a source of pollution, but just to get a sense of what is our ambient water quality. And they start to look for trends and they, you know, they can, Mindy can talk to you about what they do with that data. I'll just stop there. So if, no, if you didn't hear me, she said that they take requests and they can submit that through their website. 
I actually heard her oh, answer. Well, there you go. That yeah. was impressive. Uh, all right, so uh, is there any, any discussion or any plan of any kind to take down this building that suggested it's been a 40-year eyesore anyway? We're currently in litigation, so you can't just go to somebody's business and decide we're going to demo that. That is a court action, and the EPA, the state, the city can't make him do that. We actually started this litigation back in 2016. It's just a coincidence that we're in court exactly when this is happening. So the court case has been going on at least two weeks. It's still going on. It resumes again tomorrow, but it's up to an Oakland County Circuit Court judge to make him um, demo this building, or at least give, you know, allow that building to be demoed by someone. Thank you. Um, I, I think this has been covered, but it's it's an interesting question. Uh, the traffic, obviously, that for some number of years has been picking up these contaminants that flow out of the on the improved surface of the freeway. Any any attempt to quantify that impact? You know, the stuff being tracked in other words down the road on 696? So the release, um, as we observed, it was primarily, it was, well, not primarily, the release as we observed it was to the shoulder of 696. Um, and the road, it, and someone from, uh, Lori is here from MDOT. I don't know, maybe she, she MDOT may have had to leave. But the road is certainly constructed uh, so that water sheds off of the road and onto the shoulder, right? And so the contamination was coming down that wall and into the shoulder. So there's no reason to believe uh, that it would have, you know, gotten significantly all over the highway. You know, I mean, and I know there's questions about the flooding in 2014. Um, but during normal course of things, I think it was seeping out at low volumes onto that shoulder and washing off into the storm sewer. Um, so one of the things that, you know, MDOT did right away when we, um, when we discovered the release on December 20th was they cordoned off that shoulder and that was, you know, to aid the cleanup, but also to keep people from pulling over into that area. You know, so there may have been a direct contact issue if you just so happen to pull over and kneel down in that wet spot to change your tire. Um, but we were not, I mean, I drive that road every, twice a day, every day, right? From Woodward to Van Dyke every day for the last 15 years. Um, you know, I, we're not tracking this stuff home with us. It was, it was on the shoulder. Thank you. One of our um, residents mentions or discusses that uh, he lives in the area uh, and has kidney disease and he wonders, he lives in the area of the plant, uh, whether his kidney disease could be in any way related to this issue, this incident. So that's always a very good, a very good question and, and uh, sympathies to the individual. Um, very hard to connect a localized chemical exposure or chemical contamination to someone's individual disease. So, um, going back, if you know the, the the ones that you have knowledge of or, or typically can have some knowledge of is the occupational exposures, and if it's connected to some very unique sort of disease related to the chemical. Uh, and so, just as a for an example, okay, not a chemical, not in this situation, but the classic example of an occupational exposure is to a chemical called vinyl chloride. It causes a type of kidney cancer, and pretty much if you have that and you work in a situation with vinyl chloride, then you would know that connection. Otherwise, unfortunately, it's very, very hard to make that connection because there are so many things that could contribute to a particular, you know, organ failure, uh, contribute to a specific chemical, very difficult. I think I now understand the relation of the broken water mains. So here's a question that asks, uh, we live seven streets from the plant, um, some of the water mains and sewers were replaced recently, is it possible that these contaminants affected those pipes in any way? So I don't know, Corey, if you want to talk at all about the water system. I mean, I can take a shot at it if you, if you have anything you want to add. But yeah, um, like, we, like we put up the map, you know, the contamination is very localized around this building. Um, and so there's no reason to expect that seven streets away, uh, contamination could have entered a water main break. Um, Trisha, do you have a Yeah, and 
before we jump in, but so we've made contingencies that, um, as Tracy mentioned earlier, it's cast iron, it's under pressure, so the water main that, that runs um, on the back side of the electroplating services site um, near that nearest the service drive, um, there isn't any indication that there's obviously any problem there, but if there were to be a, a water main break, that area um, would be cordoned off and it wouldn't be repaired until until the cleanup was done and resolved. We wouldn't take any chances of uh, potential contamination entering that water main. And so I guess just to, yeah, it does make sense. I guess just, I'm sorry, I think we were both, uh, but just to sum it up, you'd be concerned about a water main break in the area of the groundwater contamination. So there's a segment of water main that runs along the service drive. Uh, you know, there's a possibility that if that water main were to break, you could have some infiltration. But again, it's still under pressure, so the water's wanting to leave the pipe, not go in it. But, um, you know, you have to be in, you know, for a water main break to introduce contamination into the distribution system, it has to be in the area of the contamination. All right. So long story short, we yes. make contingencies if I, there was a water main break. I think we're going to try and finish at 8.30. I, I, I don't have till midnight, folks. I'm sorry. Um, one last question. Um, the uh, well uh, monitoring that occurred in December, January, as I understand it. Did it occur at any time prior to that at this site? In other words, we're just I'm sorry, well. can you, what do you mean by the yes. well monitoring? Like, I'm not sure. The monitoring wells that you put in since this whole thing happened in December? So, so the monitoring wells, um, the start of the installation of the monitoring wells that we installed, there were four permanent 26 temporary. Um, they started installation of those. We started them on January 2nd. So some of them, as I said, some of them are permanent, some of them are semi, tem they're temporary, but we've left them in place. So we're utilizing those um, to continue to better understand the groundwater flow and the flow rate. Um, but those weren't installed until January 2nd for the subsurface investigation. So the question is why weren't they installed back in 2016 when I guess there was some knowledge about what was going on? So I know there's, there were two monitoring wells that are on the site, but I don't know any of the history behind those, but we're still using them. Do you know how long they've been there? No. No, um, I, there, was, there was some limited investigation of this site in the early 90s, and so I suspect that while, well that's right outside of the building may be left over from that. Um, but like I said, when in, after EPA did their initial removal in 2017, we did that preliminary assessment to see if it scored for, for Superfund. That's a desktop assessment. That's you know uh, evaluating all the information, all the data we already have. That assessment did not include going out to the site and taking soil borings or groundwater monitoring. It's it's you know it's sort of like a screening tool, and so it's based on what we already know about the site because there are so many of them to screen. So. Um, there wasn't any uh, monitoring it because there wasn't an on-site investigation done. Okay. Well, everybody out here gets an A. Everybody up here gets an A. That's a lot of complex information in a very short period of time based on my experience. So I think, I, I hope we help. I hope I help. Thank you all for sticking with us here till the end. And These please, and I, uh, I won't speak questions. for Tricia. Uh, I, real quick, I won't speak for Tricia, but you know, I'm a little slow going at the end. So if anyone has like just you know one thing like you were dying to know, it's in your pile, you didn't get it, just come up and find me afterwards. I'm happy to talk to a few of you. <laughs>